My name is Felix uh, Rodriguez Mendigutia, and uh, I am from Cuba. I was born in 1941. I served with the Central Intelligence Agency. I served with the U.S. Army a short period of time as a second lieutenant commissioned by President Kennedy. And uh, can we just jump right into your presentation? All right. Uh, I come from a small town in Cuba called San Piespiritus. And uh, I've I went to school there, uh, the La Salle School. Then in 1952, I moved to Havana. Uh, my mother went there to attend to my uncle's home, who had been named uh, Secretary of Public Work in Cuba. Uh, for one year, I, I went uh, out to La, La Salle in Marianao. And then the second year, 1953, I was in the Havana Military Academy. Then after that, I was offered the opportunity to go to uh, the United States for school. So I selected a school in Pennsylvania called the Perkiomen Preparatory School. Uh, so I went there when I was um, about 14 years old, 13 years old in 1954. And I spent from 1954 to 1960 in Perkiomen. The seventh is great and then the four years of high school. Uh, before I graduated in 1960, in 1959, my parents had gone to Mexico for vacation, which turned out to be a very long vacation. And I went to visit them in there. And then while I was there, there was the, a, a captain from the Cuban army who came from the Dominican Republic. And he was recruiting for what was the first operation against Castro out of the Dominican Republic called the Anti-Communist Legion of the Caribbean. And in that, uh, there I, I left, forgot about my schooling. I went there in, in uh, 1959. Actually, I arrived there on the 4th of July of 1959. Uh, I spent, um, you know, several months in, in there. I contracted hepatitis. Uh, the operation was a fiasco. Uh, we were supposed to go to Cuba because a Cuban major by the name of, of uh, Gutierrez Menoyo claimed that he had liberated the city of Trinidad. He was asking support from our legion in the Dominican Republic. So there was a C-46 plane that flew in there with um, weapons and also some instructor. I was supposed to be on that plane. Actually, when the helicopter came to the base that we were being trained in Calderas uh, in the Dominican Republic to take us to San Isidro Air Base and to go from there to Cuba, uh, there were five of us inside the helicopter. One of them was uh, Roberto Martin Perez, who was uh, the son of a lieutenant colonel. He was in the, in the police a little bit older than I was. Uh, when his father went to the helicopter, he said, look, that he was older than I was, that he had more experience than I was. I was uh, 17, he just turned 18 at the time, and that uh, he should go instead of me, I should go with him. So he pulled me out of the helicopter. Well, the, the helicopter took these people to, to the air base, and they flew on that plane. Uh, to train that, uh, it was a setup. Gutierrez Menoy was not defecting, he was working with Castro. Uh, all of the people that were in there were captured. Now, the guy who took my play, who was a captain in the, in the Cuban army, uh, he was killed trying to defend the plane. Because my mission was not to go there, it was to go. My mission was to uh, refuel the, the aircraft and put oil and secure the plane and then fly back with the plane to the Dominican Republic. So he was unfortunately because he was captured and he has spent the next 28 years in a Cuban prison. I contracted hepatitis. I finally came back to Miami in December of that year, 1959. So I missed one semester. I went back to school and I was able to graduate in 1960 from high school. After graduation in June of 1960, I came to Miami 
and I was accepted at the University of Miami to go for engineering and architect. Uh, nevertheless, I learned at that time that there was something going on in Central America uh, to liberate Cuba from communism. So I decided it was more important to do that than go to the University of Miami. So I enrolled what later became the Bay of Pig Invasion. So I was flowing to Guatemala where we trained there. Now there's a lot of people who, who claim and ask why this operation was entrusted to the CIA, military landing, uh, because the CIA really had no expertise on that field. It should have been given to the Pentagon. And the simple answer was that it was never meant to be an invasion that it was. In early 1960, President Eisenhower received information from our intelligence service that the Cubans were going to go into a new phase with the Soviet Union, and they were planning to bring offensive missiles into the island. So President Eisenhower at that time ordered the CIA to destabilize the Castro regime. So what the CIA did, they got a, a very professional and uh, experienced a colonel who graduated from West Point from Filipino origin. The name was uh, Napoleon Valeriano. He used the name was also Colonel Vallejo. And he was very successful in the Philippines against the communist hawk in there. Now, his concept was completely different to an invasion. His idea was to use the people that were already uprising in the mountain of the Escambra in the middle of the island to actually increase the, their capabilities and bring a provisional government to that area. So he separated the brigade in three groups, what they call the great team, special forces of the brigade or infiltration team, then the black teams, there were three of them, 25 men each, and then what they call the occupational force, was the main force of the, of the brigade. Uh, our mission with the infiltration team was to go into Cuba before anything happened, uh, landing there clandestinely either by air or by sea or by the airport, and then uh, start uh, recruiting people in the city and send it to the Escambride. And once there were enough people in the Escambray that require more weapon and training, they, they will, will send, according to requirement, the black teams. Every black team of 25 man age, they were uh, training in explosive demolition, military training, uh, to be able to receive weapon by air and by sea, air reception, maritime reception. And they would start arming that guerrilla in the Escambray. And then the idea was after that, that uh, once there was in a small territory that they could be able to liberate, then they would bring the rest of the brigade as, uh, in custody of a uh, provisional civilian government who will promise free and democratic election in Cuba within a year. And it's going to radio that with a power radio, powerful radio station that we're going to bring in and tell the world they were planning to free and democratic election. At that point, then the United States and the Organization of American State will recognize that uh, then it will be a military force composed by the uh, by the Organization of American State. I would say 95 percent Americans, maybe 5 percent Latin America, and that will be the end of Castro. They will go in there and they will take out the regime and then we could secure the, the government within a year to run democratic elections. That unfortunately didn't happen because that was an Eisenhower uh, Republican Party uh, um, plan. So in, in November, when President Kennedy was elected president, then he received the news that we were in training in Guatemala. During the debates that he had with Richard Nixon, he was very critical of the Eisenhower administration not to do anything to liberate Cuba from communism. And of course, Nixon could not tell him that we had uh, uh, already people in Guatemala have been trained to do specifically that to overthrow the Castro regime. So he was then faced with the situation that we were already there. Uh, at that time, uh, all these uh, commands of a big operation ceased with the outgoing administration and the new administration is the one that will actually uh, take over uh, the, the whatever uh, operation of, of importance will take place later on. So he decided then uh, to terminate that idea. He didn't want to go like, like they did. Uh, they were supposed to be in, in, um, in the Escambray Mountain. And he started with the idea of taking the city of Trinidad. And that was a good plan because the, Trin the city of Trinidad was pretty much anti-Castro. It was right in the heart of the Escambray Mountain, right next to the Escambray Mountain where the guerrillas were. He had a runway that we could fly our plane, our B-26 could operate from that runway in there. And then the landing didn't have to, to go the way it did. 
uh, they had a long pier in in the, in a port right, right next to Trinidad, the port of Casilda. So the brigade also could disembark, uh, just going into the pier and uh, into the land in there. So that was uh, a very good uh, operation uh, planning. Nevertheless, a little bit about two weeks before the invasion, the advisor of the president told him that it would be very difficult to deny the American participation in the invasion in a city like Trinidad, there would be a lot of press in there. And it is ridiculous because nobody could believe that a group of exiles could be able to amaze uh, that many weapons for 1,500 men, to be able to amaze tanks, they were able to amaze uh, all type of vehicles, uh, combat planes. It had to be the U.S. government. So that was ridiculous to use that uh, as an excuse uh, to terminate that operation in Trinidad. But it did. They convinced the president. And then they decided to go to a secluded area that happened to be the Bay of Pigs. The Bay of Pigs was an area that was secluded. Uh, it had only two roads of access. So the idea was to come in there with the brigade. Now, very important, we had to completely control the air. If we control the air, Castro could not uh, attack us from the air. Our planes would be able to stop them coming on those two roads that are coming in. I know Castro could not send the planes by uh, truth by boat because we were controlling the air, we would sink the boat. So that was the, the only way that we could be uh, successful in that operation. Now, the first two airstrikes that took place, uh, they eliminated like 90% of Castro Air Force. Before the invasion, there was a third strike that had to be with about uh, 16 planes to completely eliminate Castro Air Force. But during the second strike, uh, they were able to shoot down one of our planes. And um, unfortunately, the administration was telling the world that the P attacking force uh, of the planes were belonged to Castro. They were defecting Castro Air Force plane. That was not the case. It was our B-26 that were given to us from the Alabama National Guard. Now, what happened at the United Nations, Raul Roa was defending that idea that they were defectors playing from Cuba. And then Raul Roa, the, the uh, Cuban ambassador, brought pictures of the plane that they shot down. And unfortunately, the B-26s that we were using were more advanced than the B-26s that Cuba had. Our B-26s had a caliber, a 50 caliber machine gun in the nose and rockets on the wing. And the Cuban aircraft was a plastic nose and they had the machine gun on the wings. It was a completely different configuration. So when he brought those pictures to the United Nations, Obviously, at last, Stevenson understood that he was lying. So he went to his administration and he was told that indeed, yes, that it was uh, our Air Force, not Cuban Air Force. Now, he always was an aspirant to the presidency of the United States. He told the Kennedy administration that he could not lie to the world. And therefore, they put a stop to the airstrike that was crit critical to be able to control the air to convince at last Stevenson not to resign from the United Nations. What happened was that Castro was able to prevail in the air, and then he was able to sink the boat that was carrying all the ammunition, the fuel, and the rocket for our plane, ammunition for our troops, the radio station, everything. And there was not a contingency plan to resupply the brigade. And what happened there was our people fought bravely uh, for 72 hours. The first 24 hours, they took every single uh, position that were assigned to them successfully. Uh, they extended the ammunition for the second day on the 18th of April. By the 19th of April, they had no ammunition. So they did not surrender, but they had to try to run into the swamps, the swampy area around the Bay of Pigs, and try to survive. Now, most of them, I would say like 90%, 95% of the brigade were captured within several weeks. Uh, only a few of them were able to escape with the help of, of, of farmers. And they were able to make it to Havana and then take political asylum in different embassy and to be able to live in there. So that was the disaster of the Bay of Pig. We have infiltration team. We entered Cuba uh, actually before the invasion to operate with the resistance. I was part of that infiltration team. Our infiltration team did train uh, from the end of uh, December uh, to half of January in Panama, in Fort Gullick in Panama, in, in intelligence, trading, communication, psychological warfare. Uh, we use Soviet weapons because that's what we're going to be using inside. Uh, during that time, I and a friend of mine, Segundo War, have volunteered to eliminate Castro physically. We thought if we could do that, it would shorten the war 
it will save a lot of lives. So we proposed that to the American who was in charge of our training in Panama. Now, when we were flowing to Miami uh, in January, uh, I was told that the operation was approved. They gave me a German rifle, 20 rounds of ammunition. They told me not to touch the, the site, a very powerful uh, uh, telescopic site that was already pre-sighted to the things that this time I was supposed to, uh, to hit Fidel. And they added one more man to our team, Javier Soto, to be the radio operator. Now, three times we tried to go to Cuba, and there was supposed to be a boat to meet us at the coastline. There was no boat in there, and we came back all three times, and then they changed the operation. Later on, we learned that the boat that we were using was only used for that operation was a beautiful uh, white yacht uh, that belonged to Sergeant Schreifer, a relative of President Kennedy. And it was manned by an American captain and Ukrainian and Romanian crew. Uh, so, you know, at that time, they took the rifle away from me. They added two more men to my team. And we entered Cuba clandestinely by boat to operate with the resistance inside. Uh, when the whole scene fa was a failure, I was able to make it to the Venezuelan embassy in Havana, a sick political asylum that many other of my friends did. Uh, I spent like five and a half months in the Venezuelan embassy in Havana eventually was given safe conduct by the government of Cuba. And on the 13th of September of 1961, uh, I went to, um, uh, to Venezuela. I spent a couple of weeks there. I came back to the United States in, in, in late September, the beginning of October. Uh, the agency immediately contacted me and within a month, I was back inside Cuba, but taking teams. It was the only one who kept a, a line open of resupply in the Kamaway province. So I, I during that time, after the, the Bay of Peaks, uh, up to early uh, 1962, uh, I went to Cuba seven times, bringing teams through that area in the Cuban coastline. Then I came back and in 1962, I decided uh, to get married to my present wife. We're going to be married 60 years on this uh, August 25th. And I, I quit. Uh, but I told my wife there was something serious uh, about Cuba that I will go. And if she agreed with that, then we'll get married. And, and she made the mistake of agreeing to that. Now, we got married on the 25th of August of 1962. Uh, so I started working in a company called Ace Letter Service that did propaganda for the hotel at $1 an hour. And then my uncle got me a better job with towing packaging company that had to do with me. I was earning $1.35 an hour. While I was there in October, I got a call in, in October by, um, by uh, an agency from the CIA, uh, um, Thomas Klein. And he asked me to meet him uh, at a motel across from the University of Miami, uh, the Howard and Johnson. So after I finished working at Tobin Packaging Company, I went to the motel, I sat in his car, and he looked at me very seriously and said, Felix, the Marines are going to land in Cuba and we need you. It was the October crisis. So I look at him and say, Tom, if the Marine are going to land in Cuba, what the hell do you need me for? You know, and he say, well, uh, we like you to parachute uh, near a Soviet base in the back of Santa Clara area uh, to be able to set up near to that place a radio beacon. And you know how to operate a radio beacon, which I did, so that our Air Force can hit with precision going over the beacon, uh, the missile base. Now, at that time, they didn't have the GPS and the very sophisticated uh, navigation equipment that we have today. So I agreed to that, and uh, he took me to a motel. I could not even call my wife, Ross, at that time. Uh, she was working in downtown, and she waited for a couple of hours, I understand, later, and then she took a bus back to the apartment that we were living in. Uh, during the time I was in, in the motel, uh, I requested two more guys to accompany me, and they brought them to me, and they brought an instructor. Now, my training to parachute into Cuba was from a table, to jump from the table at different altitude, one at the highest altitude possible, to what they call the three point of contact, using the, the arms and the elbow and the other back, back part so that we will not break a leg. That was basically my, the only training that I received. The day that they were bringing the parachute to go into Cuba, that's the day that Khrushchev backed down on the October crisis. Uh, Castro at the time, making, or Khrushchev made an agreement with Kennedy that he will bring the missiles back if he promised that he will not uh, invade Cuba. Now, they signed that treaty, but that treaty was never implemented. 
because part of the treaty was that the United States had to be able to go to Cuba to verify that all the missiles were out. Because before he went there with all of our boat and a bunch of missiles on, on top of the boat, the American knew that they had already infiltrated in Cuba about two offensive missiles, nuclear missiles, that were already in Cuba before that display of, of boats with a lot of other missiles. Now, Castro never authorized uh, the United States to go ahead and inspect the, that they are taking out all the missiles out of Cuba, and therefore the treaty was never implemented. So after that, you know, I, I didn't have a job, so I started working with the CIA a, again. Uh, when President Kennedy came at the end of, of, uh, of 1962, he was able to brought the brigade out of prison. He took full responsibility for the operation, uh, he gave incentive to American corporation uh, to be able to get a, a tax exemption for the money that Cuba requires and tractors and all of those things to liberate the brigade. So the brigade came out of the, from Homestead, uh, arrived at Homestead at Fort Bay from Cuba in late uh, December of 1962. And at the Orange Bowl, we met with President Kennedy, I guess it was around the 28th of December. Uh, I was able to shake the hand of President Kennedy. During that time, President Kennedy went uh, on record in front of everybody at the Orange Bowl when he received in custody the brigade flag that was given to him. And he promised that he will soon return that flag in a free Havana. And I am convinced that he meant it. There's a lot of members of the brigade who believe that Kennedy was a traitor. Uh, that's not my case. I don't believe that. I believe he was a young president, ill-advised, on. No, with little experience on this situation. And of course, we had to pay the price for that inexperience that he had. But then he definitely wanted to change that and liberate Cuba. What he did, he, first of all, he brought the brigade out of prison by doing that treaty. And then immediately, he opened the armed forces of the United States for the Cubans, not only for the brigade from, from Miami. Uh, like in Fort Jackson, there were thousands of Cubans who joined there, what they called the, the Unidades Cubana, Cuban units. And he names 210, 212 officers from the brigade uh, to go into the armed forces of the United States with the rank of second lieutenant. I was one of them. Uh, you could select what uh, branch you, you want to go in. So at what, that point in time, in, in um, March of 1963, uh, we all arrived in Fort Benning, people some in Army uniform, Navy uniform, Marine uniform, and Air Force uniform. And we received the basic training. Actually, what they gave us, what they is called the OCS, Officer Candidate School, is the training that they give to the sergeants and your major that are going to be uh, promoted to, to second lieutenant. Nevertheless, they could not call that because we were already second lieutenant commissioned by the president. So they used the same block of training and they call it SOPP, the Special Officer Training Program. So we start going through the training in, in Fort Benning that uh, was several months. Uh, at late uh, 1963, before graduation, I was assigned to go to Fort Hollower in Virginia for additional intelligence training. But at that time, Dr. Artime, who was the civilian leader of the brigade, uh, visited me in Fort Benning, and he asked me to resign my commission to go with him. He told me that President Kennedy ha had authorized a special project to overthrow Castro and he wanted me to be his head of communication. Uh, we were going to have all the facility this time. We were going to be in command of the operation because before uh, the, the Cubans from the brigade have no participation whatsoever in the planning of the Bay of Pig. This time our team told me that we would be doing the planning and we the wing or we lose on our own. So I asked him, I said, Manolo, what guarantee do I have that President Kennedy is behind this? He told me, what, what guarantee do you want? I said, well, you want me to leave the army and go with you into a motel to receive a training from the CIA? Tell the, your contact with the president that I want to be trained in Fort Benning, Georgia, which were in the United States Army uniform, paid by the US, United States Army. And if they do that, I'll resign and go with you. So he told me, all right, go to your supervisor and tell him you want to move to a special communication training. So here I go to see Major Angel Torre, who was a Puerto Rican in charge of our training. And when they're saying, you know, Lieutenant Rodriguez and Major Torres, I like to change to a special communication training. So the mayor looked at me and said, look, Lieutenant, first of all, there is no such thing as special communication training. Second, if it were, it's too late. You are going to Fort Hollow in Virginia for training. And third, who told you 
said, sir, I cannot tell you. Of course, he threw me out of his office. So we finally graduated in Fort Benning. We came to Miami for uh, a little two weeks uh, period with the family vacation. Now, my wife did accompany me uh, to Fort Benning. She was with me in Fort Benning. And uh, while I was here in Miami, before I went to Fort Hollow in Virginia, I got a call from Aurora Street, who was the recruiting center here in, in Coral Gable. And they asked me to call Mayor Torres immediately. So I called Mayor Torres and said, you know, here's Lieutenant Rodriguez. Say, uh, Lieutenant Rodriguez, come to Fort Benning immediately. We have here Mr. Moose and Mr. Flanagan to give you your special communication training. So I took off them for Fort Benning. I, I met with the mayor and I requested two more of uh, Cuban that were with me in training to go with me to that operation. Uh, we were given an empty building in Fort Benning and they brought these two guys, Mr. Moose and Mr. Flanagan from the CIA. And even though I did speak English, the other two did not, did not. So they have a, a Puerto Rican sergeant to translate whose last name happened to be Castro. So, you know, went through the training of uh, communication in there. We all three of us resigned to our army commission, and then we moved to bases that our team was able to secure in Nicaragua and Costa Rica. We had in Nicaragua several bases. We had one that's uh, called Monkey Point. It was a naval base where we were using uh, attack boats, and we had mother boats, I mean, a huge fleet of boats to operate against Cuba. Uh, they had also in Nicaragua a base to train guerrillas and a base to train commando group. And then in Costa Rica, we had the training for the infiltration team, and I had a base in Costa Rica for communication uh, called Base Francisco in Tortuguero that will be trained radio operators. So to you, we moved into Central America. We started doing that operation in there that was totally sponsored by the president. And my understanding was that we, the, our team was in direct contact with Bobby Kennedy, who, who in, 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 it was also he, he was in contact with the CIA for that operation. During the time that we were there, we received all weapons from uh, Germany from in a barge that came from Hamburg, Germany, from a U.S. military base. All kinds of, of military equipment. We have the M16 that were experimental at the time. The U.S. Army was still using the M1 Garand, and we had M16. Actually, the M16 didn't have that plunger that it had on the right side. We were the one who told uh, the, the CIA that this rifle, whenever it got a lot of mud, it will malfunction. It will stop. The, the, the thing will not go forward. That's why then they corrected by putting a plunger on the right side to be able to push it forward when it got jammed that way. And we received uh, 50 caliber machine gun. We had uh, 20 millimeters to defend our base, explosive, everything that we needed. So we started the, the operation in there, but then unfortunately, President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, of course, uh, President Johnson continued the operation out of respect for the assassinated president, but he was no longer really uh, his heart was not in it to support us. So eventually, he, he, after we had a fiasco with a boat that we hit by mistake, uh, he terminated the operation and he sent people to the army uh, who told uh, the people that were officers uh, in the army that the promise of President Kennedy to liberate Cuba died with President Kennedy. Whoever wanted to stay uh, in the army, they could make a career out of that, but be knowing that's no longer the compromise of the United States government to liberate Cuba. So there were some of these 200 and some officers who left the armed forces and there's some that stayed. A lot of them uh, went later on even to Vietnam to operate. Three of our brigade members died. They were killed in Vietnam. And that was the operation that, uh, you know, that was taking place at that time. Uh, I was still working with the agency uh, in, in that time. In 1966, they sent me to Venezuela uh, to give a special training to, uh, um, for um, what they call the Casadores. They needed some communication equipment. They were fighting a guerrilla that, got, that Fidel had sent to Venezuela uh, with Captain Ochoa. That was the general that later on was executed by Castro. So, and also to set up a communication system for the CIFA. It's called Servicio Información Fuerzas Armadas. It was the, the Venezuelan Army Intelligence Service. So I worked in that as a while, then I came back to the United States. And then that was 66, in 1967, <clears throat> There was an officer from the CIA who came to Miami by the name of Larry Sternfield. Uh, he met with about 16 Cubans. He in, in interviewed 16 of us. And they was the operation to go to Bolivia. Then out of the 16, he selected two Cubans to go to Bolivia to be the advisor of the 2nd Ranger Battalion uh, in, in Bolivia. Now, Che had been spotted before in Africa in 1964. 
Uh, but they, he was able to escape in a boat in there. But then he show up in Bolivia, and when they capture uh, two a journalist uh, who was uh, Ciro Busto from Argentina and a French journalist, a, a French journalist um, um, who was later on became the advisor to President Mitterrand in France, uh, and they were able to verify that indeed that was Reyes de Bray. They were able to verify that Che Guevara was in Bolivia. Now the first combat that they had it was a disaster for the Bolivian army who were not trained properly. And a lot of these sold it through their weapons. They were captured. Uh, they were taking the weapons, their boots, their uniform. Uh, they gave one hour of indoctrination. They were sent back on their underwear. So at that time, the United States sent a special forces group from Panama to, to train a special ranger battalion who was specialized in counterinsurgency. It was commanded by Major Poppy Shelton, Ralph Shelton from Tennessee. There was about 15 or 20 of them between officer and sergeant major to train this, this ranger battalion. And they selected two of us to be the eyes and ears of the battalion to be able to provide intelligence uh, to the Bolivian op operation in, their, in the area that they were operating. And the reason they selected us, it was because there was a prohibition from Ambassador Henderson in Bolivia that no US citizen could participate in area of combat of danger. Because at that time, Vietnam was beginning to take place and a lot of advisors was coming back in plastic bags from Vietnam. And they didn't want American citizens coming back from plastic bags from Central America, from Bolivia. Since we were not US citizens, so that would not be a problem for them, you know, under that concept. That's why we went to Bolivia uh, to, to advise the second Ranger Battalion. So I arrived in Bolivia and uh, my friend, uh, I stayed mostly in La Esperanza, who was an old sugar mill, where the second Ranger Battalion was being trained by the US Special Forces. And I was assigned with Colonel Joaquin Centeno Anayo, who was the commander of the A Division headquarters. That's the area where Che was operating. When Che arrived to Bolivia, he arrived with 17 people all together. There were him, uh, there was uh, two Peruvian, there was the rest was were Cuban, Cuban officer, and there was uh, one female who was Tamara Bunke Bider, who was a German intelligence officer working for the Soviet Union. I believe she was sent to actually to spy on Che. Now, Che had become in disgrace with the Cuban government because he was pro-Chinese and Cuba depended solely on the Soviet Union. And therefore, uh, the Soviet didn't have any interest uh, in helping Che. So when Che went to Bolivia, I guess purposely, uh, the first thing that Fidel Castro did when they gave him the radio to be able to communicate back to Cuba, they gave only one radio. And when the radio arrived in Bolivia, it was broken which meant that she could receive message from Radio Havana, Cuba, but he could not transmit any message back because he didn't have any transmitter, which means he had to write letters to answer whatever inquiry was from Cuba. And that was a disaster because a letter uh, in the Bolivian system, by the time they go in, in, into one of these small towns, to La Paz, and there were two, three addresses that we call accommodated addresses where this letter was being sent to be able to make it to Cuba. One was Mexico City, <clears throat> the other one was Paris, France, and the other one is Montevideo, Uruguay. So by the time this letter arrived there, they will go to the Cuban embassy, they will put him in diplomatic parts, go to Havana. It, maybe one or two months went by, so he really had no communication whatsoever. So <clears throat> the fact actually that's why I am convinced uh, that he was sent to be killed is another one that Mario Monge, <clears throat> who was the head of the Bolivian Communist Party, had a dinner for Che on December 66, at, at uh, December 31st, 1966, in his area. <coughs> and at that time, Mario only retrieved all the support from Che. He had visited Fidel Castro before in Cuba two weeks before, or two months before. And uh, Castro told him definitely that Che would not accept to be number two. So what Mario Mohan proposed to Che was that for he, as a head of the Communist Party of Bolivia to support a guerrilla in Bolivia, the commander had to be a Bolivian. And che could be an advisor. So Che told him that he was the commander of the guerrilla for Latin America. So there was a complete breakage right there. And at that time, Mario Mohan had told the communist members of, the, of his party that were accompanying Che that if they stayed with Che, they were expelled from the Communist Party. So he had no support whatsoever from the Bolivian Communist Party. 
There was a Bolivian, a Cuban intelligence officer in the past that had been sent there before uh, Che arrived, whose name was Renan Montero. He's a very professional intelligence officer. He was able to infiltrate the government. He was uh, accepted in, in the President Barriento circle. At the time, he was even invited to cocktails at the presidential palace. So he was set up in La Paz. He was the one who actually went to the uh, airport and be able to bring all the 17 Cubans with Che into the country, right then to the operational area. And he was Che's only contact. Now, once he did that, once Che was with all his people inside, he was sent back to Cuba with the pretext that his visa had expired. That's what they told Che. They had to be recalled because he had to renew the visa, which never was renewed. Later, we learned that he had been able to acquire the Bolivian citizenship. So he was definitely sent there to be, to be killed. So his operation was really a, a disaster. He was not supported. He had a poor uh, message to the campesino, you know, the farmers of Bolivia. And he will tell the farmers in the area that he was going to give them the land that President Barrientos should have stole from them. And what she didn't realize is that Bolivia already had the agrarian reform. And all of those farms were given a lot of that land by Bahrain. So it was a complete empty message. That proved that during the whole time that he was in Bolivia, he was not able to recruit one single farmer in the operational area. He had the Cubans that accompanied him and the Bolivian from the Communist Party that was sent to him from the city. But in the operational area, he was never able to recruit anybody at all. So during that time, whenever they had an operation of, of interest and they captured some document, I was an advisor to the to Colonel Centeno, his head of intelligence, uh, Arnaldo Saucedo, the major, they would take me with him to be able to exploit the documentation, etc., etc. I was an advisor to the 8th Division headquarters. So there was one time they were able to capture one prisoner whose name was Paco, Jose Castillo Chavez. That was a guerrilla that had separated from Che to do an exploration in the area commanded by Juan Vitalio Acuña Nunez, a Cuban mayor. He was coming with about 15 guerrillas back to the uh, to the training area that he had on the on the 4th Division headquarters across from the Rio Grande. Now, to be able to cross the Rio Grande is very difficult at the time when there is the, the rainy season. And a lot, they will be able, and they, even the guerrillas lose some guerrillas trying to cross the Rio by themselves. So they went to farmers from the area to find out where was the best place to, to cross. They had contact with this farmer by the name of Honorato Roja, who had helped them in the past. Now, the army learned about that and told Honorato Roja, if he did that again, he would be in trouble with the army. So this time, Commander Acuña Nunez went to see this farmer, uh, Honorato Roja, and asked him where to cross the river to go back to meet with Shea. So he told him to wait. He was going to see what was the best place. And there was an army unit. Uh, who was run by a captain of the Bolivian army, regular army. And he went to the captain, told them the guerrilla was ready to cross the river. So they set up an ambush on that part of the river called El Bao del Yes. Then went back, he called the guerrilla to cross through that area. Of course, they were waiting in there. Now, the point man who was crossing first was the one who detected a soldier from the Bolivian army by the name of last name Vaca. He was the first one to open fire, kill, that was the only casualty of the army, and killed that soldier. Then hell broke loose and they started shooting from all sides to the guerrilla. Every one of them were killed with the exception of three. One was called El Negro, who was a doctor who the river took him, you know, he left. He was later on cap, captured, killed on the other side of the river. And there were two that were captured alive. One was Paco, Jose Castillo Chavez. And the other one was um, Mario Gutierrez Hargai. There were two of them. And during the night, the, the other one was kind of arrogant with the arm and they shot him on the spot. So Paco was brought back to Valle Grande. When we learned that, I flew in a military plane with the head of intelligence, Major Saucedo. Uh, we went right to, um, uh, to the area of, of Valle Grande. We met with the prisoner. And I knew because I have read that Paco wanted to leave the guerrilla because Paco was lying upon recruitment. He was told that he was going to go to the Soviet Union, he was going to visit Cuba, he was a communist. So it was great for him to do that. When he arrived in the area where he thought a private plane was going to take him to, to um, Uruguay to be able to get a plane to Cuba, <clears throat> he was told he wasn't a guerrilla. 
So he already had told the army, uh, the, the, uh, he already told the uh, chess and guerrilla <coughs> he wanted to leave. So at the time that he was captured, he was wounded. Uh, he wasn't even carrying any weapons. He was only carrying weapon ammunition. So I was able to save Paco's life, but they didn't like to keep prisoners. So when I was in there, I went to see uh, and at the command post in Valle Grande, it was General David La Fuente, the head of the army, who I had met before. Now, when we arrived in Bolivia, we met the first thing we did, we met the president of Pariento and, and Commander-in-Chief Obando, and we got ID card from both of them for the Air Force to give us all the support that we required. And we had the rank of Bolivian captain at the time. So I went to see General La Fuente. I told him how important Paco was for us. So he ordered that he would be given to me for, for our interrogation. So we flew Paco uh, with us in the plane that we arrived to uh, Santa Cruz de la Sierra. And we interrogated Paco for several weeks. Uh, we were very nice to him. We got, he would not allow, <coughs> he was not allowed to go. <coughs> he was not allowed to go um, to the hospital. So I asked a nurse and paid for a nurse to cure his wound, to put antibiotic and save his life. And he was instrumental in giving all the whole information on how she will move. He told us that when, when she will move from point A to point B, he will divide his group in three groups. One who was, was called Vanguard, was about eight to ten guerrillas, who was ahead of him, one kilometer ahead of him. He will move with the majority of the guerrilla in the middle, and then one kilometer behind another five, six, or eight of this guerrilla to, to be in the back. So in case there was an ambush, he was protected in the middle. In late September, there was a regular encounter of a Bolivian army unit commanded by uh, Eduardo Granchan. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there was a, a army um, the lieutenant, and he was the one who was able to kill three members of the vanguard. So we were called upon, so we drove to Pucará, a small town, and we waited there for, his name was Eduardo Galindo Granchan. He arrived with the three guerrillas, uh, dead bodies on, and three mules. And so <coughs> when I inspected them, there were three members of the Che vanguard. The pack was giving out the name of them. One was Coco Peredo, the leader of the, of the Bolivian arm, uh, guerrilla. The other one was Mario Gutierrez Adai, a doctor. And the, <clears throat> the other one was Miguel, a Cuban captain, whose name was Capitán Manuel Hernández Osorio. So with this information, we knew that Che was in the area. So I went to Colonel Centeno, explaining that and the battalion had about <clears throat> two weeks for graduation. So he told me that, he said, he said Felix, my name was Felix Ramos. He said, Felix, only two weeks, you know, for graduation, I said, me, Coronel, in two weeks, we have no idea where Shea is. Right now, we know he's right there. So I convinced him. So he cut the training short, and they mobilized the whole battalion uh, into, the, into the Valle Grande area, and then they displayed the, the, the battalion into the operational area. There was one company who was staying in Valle Grande to maintain the communication and the support of food and ammunition for the, for the army. It was company commanded by Captain Lopez Leito, who was uh, spared uh, 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 along the Rio Grande so that they would not move to the other side, who was the responsibility of another commander of the 4th Division headquarters. Another company was commanded by Celso Torrelli, who later Celso became president of Bolivia, was set up in Liguera, was the last place where she had been seen, to be able to be the support and um, to be able to reinforce the, the unit who was actually doing the search of the area who was commanded by Gary, uh, Gary Proud, Captain Gary Proud. So at that time, I was in Santa Cruz, in, in Valle Grande. Uh, I learned that they did have three aircraft combat planes that had the capability of uh, 50 caliber machine gun and 2.75 rocket. But those planes were operating, the frequency of, of radio was only operating on, on VHF, and the troops was using PRC-10 at the time that is operating in 50-some, 40-some megahertz. So there was no compatible frequency to be able to, to give them uh, air-to-ground support. So I borrowed Trent PRC-10 radios and installed one of these radios right next to the pilot model for three plane. <clears throat> it was a Sunday, October the 8th. I already had finished two planes. I was on the third one <clears throat> with Major Saucedo and Semi Capitan. We just received news from the, from the operational area of Papa and South. <clears throat> Daddy is tired, which meant and Daddy was uh, the commander of the guerrilla. So we didn't know at the time whether it was Che Guevara or whether it was 
Inti Peredo, the Bolivian commander of the area of the Coco Brother. So I jumped into the plane and the Mayor Serrat, the head of operation, jumped into the other plane. We flew over the operational area and they verified to us that the guy, the, the guy who was captured was the foreigner, or say it was Che Guevara. <clears throat> so I came back, I told that to Colonel Centeno. He immediately dispatched a Lieutenant Colonel Selly to go to the operational area and to be able to uh, try to interrogate the prisoner and secure all his documentation. And he was flowing there by Major Nino de Guzman, who was a helicopter pilot, <coughs> and he, he and the helicopter came back. That evening, we had a dinner at the, uh, at the hotel in there, uh, which, which candle because there was no electricity at the time. And uh, we had a, a brindis. I had brought a couple of bottles of scotch. And Commander uh, Colonel Centeno said, well, now we have peace in my country. And he knew the guerrilla was finished at that point in time. So I asked him if I could accompany him on the following day. And everybody wanted to go with him. Uh, of course, uh, he told to his people, I said, look, we know how much harm this guy, Che Guevara, have done to Felix's uh, country. So if you don't mind, I would fly him with me next day. So that I am also radio operator. So I have been communicating with the CIA using telegraphy and code books. So I said, <clears throat> sent a message to them saying that Che Guevara was captured alive. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we had very specific instruction in case he was captured alive to be able to keep him alive. Because we knew the Bolivian wasn't trying, to, wasn't keeping any prisoner. So I tried to keep him uh, alive at all costs. And I sent a message to the, to the agency saying, you want to keep him alive, like you told me, please move very strongly at La Paz level to make sure that he's kept alive. And now we're talking on a Sunday. So I flew in the helicopter with, um, with uh, Colonel Centeno. Uh, we landed into the, uh, on the ninth, next day, it was a Monday, 9th of October right next to Legueras around 7.30 in the morning. We came into the room. <clears throat> che Guevara was on the left side on their little window there. And in front of him, in the back of the room, there were the dead bodies of two Cuban captains. Uh, one was then was Oslo Pantoja, who was a captain in charge of training of guerrillas in Cuba. <clears throat> and another captain. Now, Centeno asking questions. Che will look to him and didn't say a word. Nothing. To a point that Centeno got man said, look, you are a foreigner. You invaded my country. At least you should have the courtesy of answering me. Che said nothing. So he left. So I, uh, outside, I, I asked the colonel if I could get all the documentation from Che to be able to photograph from my government. <clears throat> so he ordered uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sally to give me the pouch, you know, the bag that, that, that Che Guevara had all the documentation. It was like one thing that you hang in there that was straight like this with, with a cork, cork, very thick back. And inside it had the German diary, a big book, a German diary. Well, of course, it was written in Spanish by Che. He had some photographs of Che's families. He had some medicament for his asthma. He had very small code books, like 10 of things, one in red, one in black. One is for ciphering, the other one is for deciphering, who was given to him by Red China. And he had a little booklet that had message a type written message that he was able to receive from Cuba. Now, he wasn't able to transmit, but just from receive. And that message was were uh, type written in that little booklet, and it was signed by Ariel, which I thought at the time Ariel was Fidel. <clears throat> but later on, when I met the Benigno, who was, who was the right hand man for Che, who defected and was living in Paris, he told me that Ariel was Juan Carretero, who was the Cuban intelligence officer in charge of the communication. So I started photographing the, 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 the whole book. Uh, then I came back to the room by myself, look at him <clears throat> and say, Che Guevara, I'd like to talk to you. And he looked to me very arrogant from the from his floor where he was said, nobody talked to me, nobody interrogates me. So when I saw that attitude, I looked at him and said, look, Commander, I didn't come here to interrogate you. I came here to talk to you. I admire you. You used to be a head of a state in Cuba when you are here because you believe in your ideas even though I know they are mistaken. To look at me for a while to see if I was making fun of him, when he saw that I was serious, he looked at me and said, can you untie me? Can I sit? So I asked a soldier to come into the room. I told him, untie Commander Guevara. I had to give the order twice. We untied him and sat in on a little bench 
it was hard to bring him up because he had been in that position for a long time. So it took a little while to set him on a little bench that we had in there. And then I start asking questions to him. Whenever I ask him questions that was of tactical interest to us, he would look at me and say, you know, I cannot answer that. So I respected that. So we talk in different other fields. At one time I asked him, you know, uh, why do you select the Bolivia? He told me he selected Bolivia for three basic reasons. Once, if the United States, we probably have very little interest in Bolivia because it's a very poor country. And he thought in his mind that the United States would only be interested with country with a flourishing economy like Venezuela with oil. So if it was Bolivia, they would not be that much worried about Bolivia because of their Bolivian economic situation. Second, they knew that the Bolivian army was very poorly trained. He was absolutely right because they had no training whatsoever. <clears throat> and then third, and most important to him, Bolivia had boundary with five different countries. If he was able to take Bolivia, it would be easy for him to support the revolution border to border with Brazil, with Argentina, <clears throat> with Paraguay, Chile, and Peru. In another time, I asked him, I said, look, well, I, a lot of people told me that when you were in Africa, the African soldiers were very poor soldiers. He looked at me and said, well, I cannot talk about that. I said, Commander, you don't want to talk about that, but your own people told, told me that you had like 10,000 guerrillas and they were very poor soldiers. So when I said that, I said, look, if I had 10,000 guerrillas, it would have been different. But you are right. The Africans were very poor soldiers. Uh, do we talk about the Cuban economy? Of course, like they all did. Uh, he said, well, the Cuban economy is like that because of the United States embargo. So I said, Commander, that's ironic that you tell me that because you were the Minister of, for, of, Minister of, of Economic in Cuba, of industry. You were also the President of the Cuban National Bank and you are not even an economist. So he looked at me and said, you know how I became President of the National Bank? I said, I have no idea. So I was sitting one time, I was talking to Camilo Cienfuegos and I understood Fidel was asking for a dedicated communist and I threw my hand. And Fidel was asking for a dedicated economy. <clears throat> so I, I thought it was a way for him not to answer the question. It wasn't real. But then later on, when I met Benigno in Paris, he told me it was, it was true. He was with Camilo and she understood Fidel was asking for a dedicated economist and rose his hand. And then they made him the Minister of Industry and all the President of the National Bank several months later. So I went in back and forth to, to photograph the diary. At one point in time, there was a lady who came to me and said, me, Capitan, oh, an officer came to me and said, look, <clears throat> there is a phone call. There was only a telephone line communicated with Valle Grande. There is a phone call to the office, the highest ranking officer here. Now, I, I had the rank of captain and there were two lieutenants, so they called me. <clears throat> so when I answered the phone, they gave me a specific order of 500, 600. That was a simple code that we had created. 500 was Che Guevara, 600 <clears throat> was dead, 700 was keep him alive. To us to repeat it, and they repeated 500, 600. So when Centeno came back before he left, I called him aside, I said, Mi Coronel, I have you have received instruction from the High Bolivian Command to eliminate the prisoner. It was 500, 600. Now my instruction from my government is trying to keep him alive at all costs. And we have helicopters or plane to back your head to Panama for interrogation. <clears throat> the coroner looked at me and said, Felix, we're very grateful for your help. Uh, but this is order from my president and my commander in chief. If I don't comply, we'll be fired. He looked at his watch and said, the helicopter is going to come several times <clears throat> between now and two o'clock. It's going to bring food and ammunition for our troops. It's going to be taking our wounded and our dead back to uh, Valle Grande. After two o'clock in the afternoon, the helicopter is going to come back. <clears throat> you can adjust the CA him any way you want because we know how much harm he has done to your country. But I want your word of honor that after two o'clock in the afternoon, when the helicopter arrives, you will bring me back the dead body of Shep. So I said, Coronel tried to make them change their mind because it's very important for our government. But if it's not a counter order, I give you my word as a man that I will bring you back the dead body of Shep. We embraced and he left. So I started waiting to see what happened, photographing the diary, until a lady, and well, the helicopter came, like I said, several times. And this time he came, the pilot, Jaime Niño de Guzman, came where I was, say, Mi Capitan, Major Salcedo, won a picture with the prisoner. And he had with him a 35 millimeter camera. Now I had also a 35 millimeter camera and a German Pentax uh, camera. 
So and I said, Chair, Commander, do you mind? So he looked at me and said, no. So I helped him out of the room. I gave him my camera, and that's the picture that you have seen. I put my hand around him and said, Commander, look at the little bird, Mira el Pajarito. That's what you used to tell to the kids in Cuba. And he started laughing when I said that. And I thought him that the picture was taken, he was laughing. He was not. He changed his expression when he thought the picture was going to be taken. And then I took the major camera, I closed the lens, I put high resolution so the picture they didn't come out because I knew they were going to say that he died from combat wounds. And it would be embarrassing to the Bolivian government if this guy showed up with a picture with him alive. So he, was, he never was very happy with me after he learned that. So he left. <clears throat> then later on, about 12.30 in the, in the afternoon, uh, this lady came with a little portable radio. Mi capitán, mi capitán, when are you going to kill him? I said, lady, why do you say that? I said, well, we just saw you photographing with him outside. And look, <clears throat> the radio is already giving the news that he died from combat. So at that point in time, I knew that there's not going to be any counter order. So I got into the room where he was. He was sitting in that little bench. I look at him and straight the face and say, Commander, I'm sorry. I tried my best. He fully understood what I was saying. His face turned white like a piece of paper. I had never seen anybody that would, you know, lose the expression like he did. Like I say, his, his face was completely white. And then he composed himself and said, it's better this way. I should not have never been captured alive. <clears throat> he put out his pipe and said, I'd like to give this pipe to a soldadito who treated me well. <clears throat> At that point in time, Sergeant Mario Teran, who was the one he knew was executing the, the, the captured guerrillas in the area, burst into his room. Yo quiero la pipa, mi capitán. I want the pipe. So just say, no, a ti no te la doy. I won't give it to him. Put the pipe toward his body. So I ordered three times Sergeant Teran to leave the room. When he did, Che had the pipe here and said, Commander, would you give it to me? He thought for a few seconds, he gave me the pipe, I put it here, and he said, if I can, there's anything you want me to say to your family. And then I would say in a sarcastic way, he said, if you can, tell Fidel he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. Then he changed the expression and said, if you can, tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. That was his last word. He approached me, we shook hands, there was we didn't say any more word. We shook hands. We embraced each other. It was a very difficult time for me because as a military, we don't order the execution of anybody. But this was a very specific, a very special case. It was the decision of the Bolivian government. I remember when Batista released Fidel Castro from prison on December and what happened to my country. The disaster had become the destruction, the separation of family, of our economy, everything that came for that. So I told him, I said, look, you are here to advise, not to command. This is the responsibility of the Bolivian. He attacked Bolivia. And if you are successful in liberating him from here and he goes back to another country a lot of more bloodshed, you will feel responsible for it. So I did, didn't do anything else to save his life. I just left the room. I, there was Sergeant Teran right next to a Lieutenant Perez. I told him, Sergeant, don't shoot from here up. Shoot from here down because this man is supposed to die from combat. See me, Capitan. See me, Capitan. And I left. I went to the advanced post where I was uh, photographing the diary. When I left, it was exactly one o'clock in the afternoon Bolivian time. At 1.15, I heard the burst, the short burst of, of, of uh, automatic rifle of fire. I understand that Sergeant Teran Barro and M2 carabine from Lieutenant Perez with a full automatic carabine. And I was told because I wasn't present that when he came in, he said, hey, I'd like to have come to talk to you. And she said, don't be an SOB. I know you're going to kill me. He said, no. You know, you are worse to us, more alive than, than dead. And he said that because when Shea was captured and he faced at the troops that were capturing, he said, don't shoot at him, Shea. I am worse to you, more alive than dead. And then she said, you know you're going to kill me. I want you to know you're going to kill a man. So the guy opened fire and that when he was killed. <clears throat> I was still there until about uh, later on, I uh, came. Uh, about, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when the two officers came down, uh, Gary Prado and Celso Torelli, two captains. So we went into the room, and Che Guevara's body was facing the ceiling. His face was covered with mud. I believe that probably when, when, when he hit the ground, it was a dirt floor, and he got the mud in the face. <clears throat> we went around his body. He put the foot on top of, uh, their foot on top of his body and said, uh, we have finished the guerrillas in Latin America. That was Gary Prado to me. 
I said, Mi Capitan, we haven't finished them. At least we have delayed them for a long time. And Celso crossed his face with a little bar, you know, little uh, that he was carrying with him, a stick. <clears throat> I said, you are so big, you killed so many of my soldiers. Now, a helicopter was coming at that time, and they left. So I asked for a bucket of water. I went down and cleaned his face. And I tried to close his jaw and his eyes. <clears throat> I put my handkerchief over his jaw to close it. Now, the eye had been several hours open, and he just popped up again several times. So I gave up and tried to close his eyes. So we had a stretcher. We got his stretcher and put it on the right side of the helicopter. <clears throat> While I was doing that, the pilot of the helicopter, Nino de Guzman, to me, and Capitan, moving forward. To, to, to be able to, uh, to balance the weight. So I put the hand on the paralysis, it was full of blood, so I cleaned the blood on my pants. I thought to myself, uh, they claimed that there's some people have blood in their hand, and I have a lot of blood in my hand. So I finished tying him down. And at that point in time, a soldier came to the pilot and said, Mi Capitan, Mi Capitan, a mi mayor, my father Chiles want to see him. So we stayed about two, three minutes with the helicopter running, and this priest was a French uh, Catholic priest, he came on top of the mule very close. He almost got decapitated, but he got down. He looked at Shea, and he gave him the last benediction. And I thought to myself, this guy was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but nevertheless, he received the last ritual of the Catholic Church. So uh, finally, we took off in the helicopter. Uh, when we landed in, in Valle Grande, when we left, there was nobody the wrong way, or maybe a few planes. At this time, they were full of a small plane from the BBC, NBC, CBS, Associated Press, everybody from the press was there. And about, about 2,000 people. <clears throat> so everybody came toward the helicopter. So I put my cap down. I left on the red, left side so that they would not photograph me. So I was not photographed. And my other friend who was there, he picked up the body and they took it uh, and took it to the hospital. Metro Senor de Malta, we was set up in a cleaning area that they had about 50 meters in the back of the hospital itself. That way he was exposed. So I stayed in the helicopter with the Major Serrato, the head of operations, Saucedo, the head of intelligence, and the pilot. And then in the evening, there was a, a, a gathering together. Uh, when I arrived, a general was telling a colonel, if Fidel denied this is Che Guevara, we need tangible proof of it. So they tried, you know, to propose it to cut it the head. And I say, you know, that. Uh, if, if you are had a head of a state, you cannot do that. Uh, so they caused both hands and put it in for my life. Later was taken to Cuba. And I understand Fidel kept the hand in there and showed it to high dignitaries who visited uh, Cuba at, the time, at that time. So I went back to, to um, Santa Cruz. I was then sent by the, uh, my, my boss in America, who was our case officer, to La Paz uh, with all of these films. I was met then by the embassy people in there and I delivered all the films. I had one of them that I put in X. I say it's a picture of Shea and myself in this uh, roll of film. And then I flew back from there to, um, to Santa Cruz. <clears throat> the following day, General Robert Porter, who was the commander of, uh, of the um, South, uh, South Com at that time in Panama, he sent a C-130 to pick us up because there was a lot of talk in the area of the participation of the CIA in the operation. So I sent a C-130 to pick us up. Now, when the C-130 landed in Santa Cruz, he got a flat tire. And they didn't have any extra tire to change. And they wanted to get us out of there. So Colonel Fox, who was the commander of the mid group in La Paz, he flew on a C-54 plane to pick us up. Uh, my friend, uh, Yoldo, um, the Americans, and, and myself, three of us. So we were taken to La Paz. We landed at the El Alto airport. And then we didn't even go to the runway, to the to the ramp, to the uh, building. We stayed at the end of the runway, and then several cars from CIA personnel arrived there. So each one of us, three of us, went to different CIA personnel, and we stayed that night in their home. Then on the following day, General Porter sent another C-130 who landed in Valle Grande. He dropped uh, a pair of tires and a jacket to be able to change the tire. He flew to La Paz, picked us up and flew us to, to Panama. Now, we stayed in Panama for two weeks for a period of, of um, cooling off period at the time. Now, in next day that we arrived, we took, they took us, especially me, to talk to, to the general, uh, who was the commander-in-chief of uh, General Porter, who was the commander-in-chief of Southcom. Uh, he wanted to know my conversation with Shea. 
Now, when we were there, we were issued ID cards that we, we could buy at the PX. And my ID card that they gave me said, uh, you know, visitor's pad was 007. I still bought something in there with uh, had the number 007 attached to it. So after two weeks, uh, we were flowing on a military contract playing with, with the branding with a lot of other military people to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, from there to Washington. That was the end of, of the Che Guevara operation. And after that, they sent me to go briefly in 1960, that was in 1967. In 1968, uh, the beginning of it, I was taken to Ecuador. Uh, we we uh, trained on a special, a special unit for the presidents. They were supposed to be like the our secret service. And we had people that we trained from the army, from the navy, from the air force, and from the police force. Then we were taken back to Miami, and then at the middle of 1988, uh, I uh, 68, excuse me, I was sent then to to Peru. I was an anti guerrilla unit in Peru. It was the 48 Commandancia Guardia Civil. It was a unit that was specialized. It was a paratrooper unit specialized uh, actually in uh, uh, attacking the Sendero Luminoso terrorist group in the in the area. Now, when I arrived, uh, I learned it was a paratrooper unit. There's only two police paratrooper unit in the world. One in Peru and one in Canada. So the commander of the unit, the commander Camilo uh, Danilo Gramonte, when I arrived, said, Senor Assessor, are you a paratrooper? And out of embarrassment, you know, I'm supposed to be their advisor. I am not a paratrooper. I say, Yes, sir. He says, How many jump? I said, 100. I had never jumped in my life from a plane. So he asked me, Would you jump with us this afternoon? It was on a weekend. I said, Of course. Then I went to see a captain that I have met him, Javier de Vincent. I said, Javier, how the hell do you put this thing on? He said, you have never jumped. I say, no. He said, you're nuts. You're going to get killed. I say, no, no, no. I took the training from the bench uh, back in October in 1961. And, you know, I jumped several times. Let's go and practice that. So we went to my room. We got a higher table. And then we made it three point of contact. <clears throat> then I jumped with them for about... 11 times, and I got my wing, or 13 times, I got my wing from the Peruvian Air Force as a paratrooper. But I never jumped in the plane before in my life. I was supposed to be there two years, but after about six months, there was a military coup of General Velasco Alvarado. <clears throat> so what we did, we requested a, an Air Force from the Peruvian Air Force that was a C-46 uh, that we used, to, we used by, by our unit to parachute uh, in the area. And the commander of the unit did not went along with the military coup. So he asked the plane for a training exercise. And he called all of us, including all his unit, and he said, look, when the plane arrived, we're going to take over the plane, and we're going to force the pilot to fly off over the presidential palace. <clears throat> and we are going to jump in there, and we are going then to try to regain the presidency for the constitutional president, Fernando Belaunda Terry, who was the one that General Alvarado had deposed. Now, <clears throat> Knowing that the coup was taking place, they never sent the plane to the unit. So we could not do that. And then our unit was surrounded by the army unit from, from the <clears throat> from army unit in there. Now, we never got to fight each other because that had a sort of a standoff in there until uh, in the evening that the head of the, of the Peruvian uh, police, uh, General Barrios, he knew that the, the, the military coup had consolidated. So he went along then with the group. So the army went back to the bar and we stayed in there. And then when we rotated for vacation on Christmas, <clears throat> Velasco Barrao started buying all of this military equipment from the Soviet Union. And there was a, a stop to the military assistance to the Peruvian Air Force and army. So I never came back to, uh, never came back to, uh, uh, to Peru. Now, after that, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. Vietnam was taking place. So I was interviewed, uh, actually, by the head of, uh, of uh, CIA in Venezuela. And there was a point in time in, in late 1969 that I was told that I was accepted to go to Vietnam by, by Ted Chaplin and also by Tom Polgar from Venezuela. I could select. So I told them, if you feel I am more important in Venezuela, I go there. But if it is my choice, I prefer to go to Vietnam because I've never been there. So they assigned me to Vietnam. So I arrived in Vietnam in early 1970. I started operating with a unit called the PRU. 
the provincial reconnaissance unit. That was a, a paramilitary unit that well, allegedly was under the national police, but it was totally controlled by the CIA. We pay them, we select them. Most of them were former Viet Cong or Bushi people that, uh, Hoi, people that had uh, defected from the Viet Cong. So they were excellent unit because they, they knew how they operated. And of course, before they used, we used them, they were heavily compromised. So we had more confidence in working with them that was regular a troop from the, from South Vietnam. So we had 11 provinces that I was assigned to region three, what 11 provinces around Saigon. <clears throat> so I started, you know, operating with them, uh, operational area. We had two main missions that they told me. One was to try to stop the rocketing of Saigon. I started the rocketing of the boat coming into Saigon. What was happening was uh, they were both coming with weapon, all kinds of things for the for the army. And whenever they went to the river into the Saigon area, <clears throat> they were actually shot from the from the from the uh, from the side of the river. They were shot the boat with RPG seven with rocket. And they were escorted by the Navy uh, gunship, the Sea World, but they would hit the head of, of the explosion and they never got anybody. And also they were rocketing Saigon every week. It was a psychological type of operation. Really, they tried to point this point, one 22 millimeter rocket from the Soviet Union. They tried to point toward the American embassy and to the presidential palace, but they never hit, it was nearby. But it was a psychological thing to be able to say that uh, the United States with 500,000 troops in the area, they could not stop the rocketing of Saigon. So I concentrated basically in those two operations. Now, about the river, uh, we were able to capture at one point in time, what we call a sapper, a special uh, forces guy from the, from the Viet Cong. And we found in his backpack, he got an electrical green cord about 60 meters long. Now, what they were doing, they were setting up the rocket on the side, on the side <clears throat> of the river with a point of reference pointing to the boat. And then from 60 meters away, the guy was electrically activated the rocket. So whenever they saw the explosion in the middle, they, the, the sea wolf would hit that area. There was nobody there. So they could not get anybody. Now, knowing this, I called all the sea wolf pilots to fly on a, on a Huey. <coughs> and I set up my PRU in the river. We put a, a red smoke grenade in the middle and two yellow smoke grenades 60 meters on each side. We didn't know from which side it was going to activate the rocket. So they could calculate the distance between the explosion and where they were sitting. So from there on, <coughs> whenever they saw the explosion at night, the sea wolf would hit 60 meters on one side and 60 meters on the other side. They had no idea what, what was going on. We were able to eliminate seven different of these teams uh, that were killed during this operation. And the rocket of Saigon stopped. Now, later on, because of that operation, the, the commander of the Vietnamese Navy gave me the Navy Medal of Honor, which is one of the medals that I kept from Vietnam. Now, about the rocketing of Saigon, uh, it's no way that we could find the, the team that was doing that. Until we were lucky to capture this guy, Quan, who was the bodyguard of Tutan, who was a colonel from the Viet Cong, who was the commander of, uh, of the area that were doing the rocketing of Saigon. It was a sub-region 4 unit. Now, what he told us, that they were hiding in this area that we never looked into it. Why? Because the water tide will go up about 16 feet, or 10, 15 feet. So it was impossible for anybody to live in there. Now, what the Viet Cong was doing, under a big tree, they were used 55-gallon drums, and they would solder one on top of the other. So when the, the river and water start going up, <clears throat> he jumped on the top of the of the of the 55-gallon drum and stay up there dry. When the water came down, then they would run with the rocket across the river. They fired the rocket into Saigon, then run right back and got on top of that 55-gallon drum again. And they were safe. And we never look in there because we knew that it's impossible for them to be there because of the tide going up that, that high. So then we start looking at when the tide came down, we start looking with the helicopter. I flew the, the huge 500 at three top level. I had gunships who were supporting me in the back. <coughs> now, because they have come down from the from there and the, and the mud was very fresh because, you know, the water had just drained out. It was very easy to see their marks and running around. 
So we were able to eliminate most of them. So on December the 4th of 1970, we had a big encounter near the river with two tanks group. And we were able to kill about 16 of his guerrilla, including two tanks. From that day on, there was not a single rocket that was fired into Saigon. We continued to put the pressure on them. That day, we lost two PRU. They were, they were, they, they were killed, not three of them. They were killed, several others were wounded. I went with the troops. I, I was able to pick up uh, one of them and take it to 24th Iraq Hospital. And from there on, they weren't able to, uh, to actually um, do anything uh, anymore of the rocket. Not a single rocket landed in Saigon until after I left in 1980, in 19, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1972. I, I had one tour of duty in Vietnam for a year and a half from 1972 to <clears throat> 1970, the beginning of 72, and I extended <clears throat> because of back problems, because I had crashed down several times in Vietnam. <clears throat> I was evacuated, but you know, with, with a lot of pain uh, in 1972 back to the United States. During that, during that time, we were also able to run a very successful operation in Kushi, but the famous Kushi tunnels, which is between Cambodia and, and Saigon. They had a big unit who was operating in that area. During that time, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, Second Field Force Army thought that they were still in Cambodia. So they programmed a big operation with uh, American and Vietnamese troops up in Cambodia thinking this unit was going to be there. Now, I had some good intelligence of this area in near the Cushy tunnels. So I proposed the plan second field force through my boss, Don Gregg, and then Don came to me and said, look, your operation has been canceled because they are using all the helicopter assets to this big operation in Cambodia, uh, north of the Cushy tunnel where I was going to go. But if you want to go and see the, the commander of the unit who can change that, General Hollingsworth, who was a two-star general who was, uh, he was a hell of a general, one of the best that I have ever met in my life. He, he looks like another Patton. He actually was Patton 67 Regimental Tank Commander during World War II. And he speak like Patton, he used that revolver and decide like Patton, and he was a great officer. So I went to see him, he used to call me Chichi, because of Chichi Rodriguez, the foot, the, um, the, um, and the, the golf player from Puerto Rico. So when I arrived to see him, he said, Chichi, what are you doing here? I said, General, uh, I have this operation. I had all, all the Italians, all the photographs on the air and everything uh, to show it to him. So I showed him uh, the intelligence that we had that was pretty good. So he said, Chichi, I like it. So let me call General Hamilton. He was the commander of the 1st uh, Cavalry, who was in, in that operation up in Cambodia. And when General Hamilton came, he said, hey, General, Chichi here have a great operation. I'd like to support him. Can you spare? A few helicopters. Say, Chichi, what do you need? He say, I need a huge 500. I need a, at least a couple of gun ships and some transport troops. So they provided to me. So we started the operation. It was a complete success. There was a lot of people in my area. And then on the other side, it was different. They didn't find anything. So even the planes were coming, the F-4 were coming back full of bombs, and they would contact us by radio, and we were giving them targeting our area. <clears throat> so after that, uh, I went down, and in the one time I was uh, flying with the helicopter, and my boss, Rudy Andrew, came flying, and they saw it was, you know, it's a lot of enemy fire in the area. And they sent a plane, and they could not hit the target. And all two planes was the one which they called the spotter, who will mark the target in the area for the Air Force. And he was shooting different places, and it was a point that they could not find out. Uh, I actually hit the, the target that was supposed to dump the bomb. And the plane called me and said, look, I have only five minutes of station time because I am running out of fuel. <clears throat> so I told my pilot, Charlie Marvin, okay, let's go down ourselves and we mark it with a smoke grenade, a color grenade. My boss was listening to that, say, no, 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 no. It's very dangerous. Uh, I will get a helicopter from Kuchi to fly and you can direct them. It was not time to that. We only have five minutes. So I told my, my pilot, I said, look, we didn't hear anything. So we went down actually and marked the target. Uh, and it was very successful. <clears throat> now, he went back. He was pretty unha unhappy because I disobeyed him. So when I came back from the operation, <clears throat> Don Greg was laughing and said, uh, Felix, you have been grounded. What do you mean I have been grounded? I said, yes, you disobey Rui's order and you are grounded. You can no longer fly at three top level. Or you have to fly over 2,000 feet from now on. Okay. On the following day, 
Don Gregg went to second field force and General uh, General um, Hollingsworth told him and said, look, we didn't find anything there. We like to go with all our troops into Chichi's area. But he is the one who knows the target that I like him to mark, you know, the target for us. If I like him to fly and mark the target for our our unit. So my boss called me and said, look, I'm going to leave. They were going to be three days operation by the, the, the army and the army forces that have nothing to do with us. He said, I'm going to leave the restriction for three days so that you, because the general wants you to mark the target. I said, uh-huh. Either you leave my restriction for the rest of my tour, I will not fly. So he leaves the restriction. I will continue to fly with them, you know, after that uh, operation in there. So when I came back, eventually in 1972, <clears throat> I finally came back to the United States evacuated because of back, back pain. So uh, the agency gave me some, uh, I had to go to doctors in, 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 um, in Washington. They, they saw my back and everything. And then before I left, I gave a tour to Argentinian general. Sanchez de Bustamante, that spoke only Spanish, and they assigned me to give him a tour of one day of the military region we were doing there. And he, he asked them that he wanted me to be his advisor. So he was told in Vietnam, if he wanted me, he had to do it through the, the American embassy in Buenos Aires. So when I arrived there, they told me that the general indeed had gone to our embassy. He wanted me to be his personal advisor in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. <clears throat> because it was very important to them, because he was number two guy in the country. The president was General Lanuse, and he was the head of, of the First Army Corps, the most important, second most important guy in Argentina. <clears throat> so they, they wanted to have me as an advisor to them, because they would be right inside the, the, the reign of power in, in Argentina. So they, they lifted the restriction that I had, but they told me I had to go to Panama to check my back every six months. So that was the first time that I was with my family. So I took my wife and <clears throat> my two kids to Argentina. Now, at the end of 1971, when I came back to the, you know, I forgot to mention, when I came back to the United States at that time, I was told by our, our station in Saigon not to fly directly to Miami because there was a Cuban defector in Paris who said that they were planning the kidnapping of the plane or hijacking the plane of the Cuban involved in the assassination of Che Guevara. So I didn't fly, they asked me not to fly into Miami, so I flew to Atlanta, <clears throat> I rented a car, I drove to Miami, I spent 24th of December with my family, the, the New Year's. <clears throat> then on the 7th of January, I went back to Atlanta. I had a flight that go from Atlanta to Houston, Houston, San Francisco, San Francisco, then Hong Kong, and then from there back to Vietnam. And I had like four, five hours overlay in San Francisco. I have a cousin who visited me in Atlanta, so I saw there was a flight that leaves one hour later, and instead of stop, uh, stopping in Houston, stopping in, in Dallas. So I changed that. At, at that last minute, I changed for that plane to stay one more hour with my cousin in, in Atlanta and one less hour in San Francisco. So when I got to Vietnam, nobody was waiting for me at the airport. Normally, they send somebody to pick me up. So I took a Lambretta with a Vietnamese driver. I went to the Duke Hotel. I changed. I got to the U.S. Embassy. And when I arrived, the first guy, so I said, look, what happened? Nobody was waiting for me. He said, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean doing here? Are you supposed to arrive today? I said, yes, but the plane that we have in record was hijacked to Cuba. So the original plane stopping in Houston was hijacked to Cuba. So this time when we went to Argentina, what the agency was, they did was they got my wife's passport and my passport, who was with real name, who said place of birth Cuba. And they had the State Department to issue the same passport, but instead of saying, place of birth you was a place of birth Colorado for both of us <clears throat> so in case the place were hijacked they will claim me as a U.S. citizen born in the United States so that's the only time from during that period of time that I was born in this country really and I used that doc documentation during the time that I was in Argentina <clears throat> but in 1973 there was election in Argentina and uh, Campora who was a Peronist took place and they immediately retired my general and the day they immediately re-established a relation with the Cuban government, the day that the Cuban ambassador arrived in Buenos Aires, I was taken out of the country to Uruguay and then back to the United States. And then I had a very uneventful uh, stay in, 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 with the agency in the Miami area. I was uh, what called Island Hopper. Uh, they, they have people in the station here in, in Miami that was covering the island that didn't have any CIA station there, like <clears throat> Dominique for the France, 
<coughs> that were a small place that the embassy didn't have any CIA station. So we run the agents out of Miami. And that's what I did. I used to go to those areas uh, to run the, uh, the, the, uh, the intelligence for those little islands out of the Miami area. I did that from 1972 uh, after I came back to about 1974. During that time, uh, I was asked to evaluate this lady who was a school teacher in Dominica, uh, though in the island of Dominica. So, you know, I met with her, I had dinner with her. She was a great lady, very intelligent. We gave her, you know, a recommendation to the agency that she was one of the greatest person we have met. She was very intelligent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Later on, when there was the invasion of the United States to Grenada, I learned that she had became the prime minister of Dominica. <clears throat> she was the one who was the, the, the one who was the, uh, the head of, of the coalition, uh, even though the United States provided with 90% of uh, troops and everything. She was the head of the coalition that invaded Grenada at that time. So in 1975, uh, you know, uh, my back was, was not, not good. <clears throat> they already had uh, another attempt on my life. So the agency decided to retire me with disability. Now, Jimmy Carter had become president of the United States. And the, actually, the paramilitary apparatus of the CIA was being basically dismantled by him. <coughs> People said in the agency probably that the, the director, uh, Admiral Turner, was the worst director of the CIA. Uh, they really they, they did completely destroyed our intelligence capacity. Uh, the President Carter, I understand, is very naive. He was asked our people from the CIA to brief him about our penetration in the terrorist group. So he was briefed that when we uh, had a guy penetrating, for example, Hezbollah or one of these uh, terrorist group, and the guy would report operations they were doing, <clears throat> there was a very pragmatic group that will evaluate the operation itself. There were times, uh, there were times when the uh, uh, where they were, uh, if it was some operation they were going to do that will cause, you know, hundreds of casualties, of course, they would not allow it to go. But in, for, for, for our infiltrator to be able to race within the rank, sometimes they allowed a small operation that only will have maybe few casualties uh, to go ahead and go through it. Because if every time that this guy is, is in this group, the operation was not functional, they will know there was an infiltrator. So it was a very pragmatic uh, evaluation from this group to be able to allow the operation to go through to make sure that this guy would go higher. Of course, if it was an operation, there would be thousands of people killed if they would have stopped and burned him if necessary. Well, Jimmy Carter told them, our agency, that it was immoral to do that. And his request, <coughs> all of this penetration that we had in all of these terrorist groups, including Sendero Luminoso in Peru, they had to be terminated. We had to tell them that we no longer were uh, supporting them. Uh, we recommend that they leave the guerrilla or the, this terrorist group. And we lost the capability of infiltrating all of these big groups. That's why 9-11 took place. That's why in, in Peru, uh, they were able to take the, uh, the Japanese embassy. Sendero Luminoso was able to, to take the Japanese embassy. Because the guy that we had with Sendero Luminoso had to be terminated because of Jimmy Carter's uh, directive to the agency. And later on, they authorize again to be able to do that, but it takes a long time to be able to recover, recover, recover this capability. I don't think they have recovered completely even today. So that was the end of that. Then uh, in 1976, I retired. Uh, before that, in 1975, they sent me to, um, to um, Lebanon. <clears throat> it was supposed to be training a uh, intelligence unit uh, for the army, Lebanese army with Christian army. Uh, but I couldn't do it. I arrived there. I spent a month in Lebanon. Then the war started. I left on the last plane, and the last plane that left there from London and back to the United States. So I retired actually in 1976 from the agency. But I continued to, to do things that I thought it was worthwhile to do it. I learned, for example, the situation in El Salvador. <coughs> it was, they had a guerrilla uh, operating in the area against the government. And I thought that the concept that I had developed in Vietnam uh, would be useful in El Salvador. <coughs> that picture is when I was actually in Nicaragua with the contrast, uh, helping them in operation they got near the, the San Juan River 
across from Nicaragua. But then, at that time, then uh, I start uh, trying to get to El Salvador to be able to implement my concept. And it wasn't easy. Uh, I was a civilian. Uh, it was not difficult. Uh, now that picture, went by, I'm crashing El Salvador one time in guerrilla territory. I went back to recover the helicopter in here in there. Now, to be able to get to El Salvador, it wasn't easy at all. Uh, finally, I was, I was helped by the White House, by Vice President Bush office, because my friend Don Gregg, who was my, my boss in Vietnam, had become the National Security Advisor to, to Vice President Bush. And he knew how effective my helicopter concept was. <clears throat> so he asked me, he allowed me to have a meeting with um, Thomas Motley, Secretary of, of State for Latin America, to recommend that I be allowed to go there. And also with Nestor Sanchez, Secretary of Defense. And uh, then uh, General Gorman, who was the commander in Southcom, learned about this. And of course, uh, he wanted to meet me because he's the one who's responsible for actually for advisor uh, of, of all the military units in Latin America. And here is a, is, a, is a Cuban retired from the CIA, which is not under his control, implementing a helicopter concept in his area with the Salvadorian Air Force. So he asked uh, through Admiral Murphy, who was the military advisor to the vice president, wanted to meet me. So I flew to, to Panama. I met with General Gorman. I briefed him on the operation. He, he liked the operation itself. And I asked him that I wanted to visit El Salvador, so he sent me in his private plane <clears throat> to El Salvador and asked me to also brief his uh, military group commander, Colonel Steele. So I met Colonel Steele, I introduced him, showed him the concept that I was uh, proposing, which he liked, it. and he accompanied me to see Ambassador, um, uh, um, who was the ambassador of the United States there. <clears throat> and, and I briefed them on the operation. So finally, in early 1985, I was able to go to El Salvador to start my helicopter concept. Now, before I went there in late 1964, uh, I met uh, Oliver North at the request of the Undersecretary of State for Science and Technology, Bill Bowdy, who told me if I was planning to go to El Salvador, I should meet Colonel North, who got a lot to do with Central America. And I told him, look, if I have the direct contact with the Vice President, what, why do I need to meet the Lieutenant Colonel? And he told me that Lieutenant Colonel was very powerful in Central America. I should meet him. So make arrangements with Fun Hall. I met the Colonel, explained what I was doing. So he knew who I was. I was going to El Salvador. So I started trying to set up this concept in El Salvador that wasn't easy at the beginning. Until finally, on the 18th of April, we were able to run the first operation that was very successful. And we were able to capture Nidia Diaz, the commander of the PRTC, which is the <clears throat> In the unit that assassinated the U.S. Marines in the Zona Rosas in El Salvador. That operation, where I was able to wound her and capture her alive. And later, she was exchanged by President Duarte's daughter, who was being kidnapped, was kidnapped by the guerrilla, and they made a, a exchange with her. Uh, and and Nidia Diaz went to live uh, in Cuba at that time. So I worked with the Salvadorian Air Force during their operation. Now, while I was flying with the Salvadorian Air Force, I got a letter in. I think it was about 25th of, of September of 1985 from Colonel North. <clears throat> he asked me if, if I could arrange uh, for a plane full of weapons to be a storage in El Salvador that was for the Contras. What I learned later was that the Contras uh, that he was supporting, <clears throat> one of the Contra people brought the plane full of, uh, now from the United States, you could not bring any military equipment into, into the war because of the Bolan Amendment, who was a congressman who, uh, for a period of time, denied any military assistance to the Contra. Now, they could use money uh, for food, for, uh, for, for um, uniforms, backpack, communication gear, but not for military equipment. That's when Oliver North uh, went and Reagan commissioned him to try to help him legally. And what he did was uh, they utilized uh, the, the, the king of Saudi Arabia provided, uh, King Faisal provided $1 million a month for military equipment. And, and that was okay. That wasn't in violation of the Bolan Amendment because it was money that did not belong to the United States government. <clears throat> what happened at this point in time that, that one of the contracts leader brought a plane with uniform that was legal from the United States into the Panama military base, but they brought in 
a television crew. And the Honduran were really upset because even though everybody knew they were helping, you know, it was ridiculous uh, you know, to bring a television crew to film the support of the Contra inside a Honduran military base. So they returned the plane with everything and they stopped and ceased all the operation of support to the Contra until they could solve that problem with North. Now, at that point in time, North had a Southern Air Transport plane in Portugal, where he had bought weapons for, for the contract, and the plane was stuck in there. They couldn't fly to Honduras because they had a prohibition to land in Honduras, and it was costing them a lot of money. <clears throat> so he asked me if I could get the approval from the Salvadorian Air Force and government to be able to bring the plane with all this ammunition and equipment, a storage in El Salvador until we could solve the problem in Honduras, and then and they were able to fly the rifle to Honduras. So he asked me to do that. So I went to see General Bustillo and explained to him the situation. Of course, uh, the Salvadorian were very much in support of that because they knew that all of these weapons, eventually the, the Nicaraguan government was sending all of these weapons to Salvadorian guerrillas. So they, they were in agreement to help the country. So I went to see the Minister of Defense, they agreed. And we were able to fly that plane in with all this military equipment we storage temporarily in El Salvador. <clears throat> when he saw that, then he asked me to request from the Salvadorian uh, Air Force if they could maintain their plane that they were buying for wrong operation in, in, inside Nicaragua in support of the country. Do the maintenance in El Salvador. They were going to bring the plane, they were going to bring the mechanics. The Salvador had to put nothing. They would supply everything for this maintenance. And for the fuel, they would pay the fuel that they made the planes use out there. So the, they, they agree, and that's how I became involved with the Nicaraguan uh, support of the Nicaraguan resistance. Later, I had to testify in Congress. So we started doing that out of El Salvador until uh, the day that there was the plane that was operating out of El Salvador was shot down over Nicaragua by a Soviet rocket. And they captured the American the kicker of the plane, Eugene Hasenfoss. And then he mentioned my name. The name that I used in El Salvador was uh, Max Gomez. He mentioned that Max Gomez was, he was in charge of this operation. Now, the Cuban knew that was, Max Gomez was Felix Rodriguez. So when Mike Wallace went to Nicaragua and did a 60 minute segment with Hasenfoss, my name came up publicly. And then after that, immediately then Congress. Uh, subpoena me to testify in the Iran Contra. Now they wanted their main objective was to try to implicate George Bush into the Contra operation. They wanted to say that I, I was sent to El Salvador to violation of the Bolan Amendment to try to supply the Salvadorian uh, from the with the Nicaraguan resistance support. <clears throat> that my flying in El Salvador was a cover story for me to be there. It was the other way around. I went to El Salvador to fly my concept, and then because of this request from North, I got involved with the Nicaraguan resistance. <clears throat> but nevertheless, then they subpoenaed me that I had to testify in Congress. Now, uh, when they did that, everybody, in, in all these hearings, on the Iran-Contra hearings, everybody carried with them a lawyer. <clears throat> I felt I had done nothing wrong, so I decided I was going to go without a lawyer. Now, even the office of the right president wanted me to bring a lawyer. And when they asked me, I said, no, I don't need a lawyer. They said, look, uh, I know that the vice president didn't do anything wrong, but you don't know the Congress. They might turn you around saying something that might hurt him. We recommend that you bring a lawyer. We will pay for it. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. And I refused to do that. So I was the only one who went there to testify on the 27th and 28th of May of 1987. We saw the lawyer and we saw immunity. So those two days, uh, I was being grilled by, by, the, uh, by the, the, the Iran Contra uh, panel. Now, the first day, 27th of May of 87, uh, what, what they do is they have the, the lawyer, in my case, was Paul Robadoro, to bring my life completely into the, uh, the whole day. From the day I was burned, what I did in Cuba, my school, <clears throat> the Bay of Pigs, everything. And then he will go in detail when, when I went to El Salvador on trying to portray you know, my participation with this operation of Iran Contra thing. Then on the second day, is different. On the second day, the first hour is dedicated to two senators and two congressmen who were supposed to read all of your deposition. Now, I was giving a bunch of deposition to it. And I had to conduct several depositions at the Senate. 
Now, when that happened, one thing I didn't know, my son uh, and my daughter went to see Carlos Duran as a FBI agent. When I retired from the CIA, they kept me in contact with one FBI agent in case they needed any problem with security. Because, you know, being a federal agent, my security depended on the federal government, not the local police. <clears throat> so I always had a contact with the bureau in case, you know, I see anything wrong near anybody following me, whatever, I would contact the FBI. So my son and my daughter were very young. They went to see him and they told him, uh, Carlos Duran said, look, <clears throat> we are listening that my father doesn't want to bring a lawyer. And we have been told by other people that if he doesn't bring a lawyer, he will go to prison. <clears throat> they had no idea really what the situation was. So they told him, you are a close friend of my father. Please convince him to bring a lawyer. So Carlos came to see me to my home. I didn't know at that time that my son, my daughter, uh, had met with him. I learned that just a few months ago from his widow. And uh, he told me, I said, look, Felix, you're going to testify in front of Congress, and you're going to be on the roads. Let me give you an advice. You cannot lie. Believe me, if you lie, they will ask the question in 15 different ways, the same question, and they are going to find out that you are lying and you will go to prison. Now, if there is something that you do not, that you don't, you don't feel comfortable with it, you don't remember, but don't lie. If there is anything that you are, you, are, you have conflicting memories, whatever it is, you say you don't remember, but don't lie. And that's what I did. I got the only one without lawyer, without immunity, and everything went well. So I testified in Congress in front of that, uh, of that committee. Then later on, <clears throat> that's one thing that I always like to mention. Later on, I was subpoenaed by Senator Kerry. I want to tell you from the beginning, I don't like him. Senator Kerry at the time uh, was in a committee with uh, again narcotics and a special operation that he was the head of because they controlled the Senate. He heard me testify during my Congress testimony on the 27th, 28th of May. During that time, they asked me if I had knowledge of the contrast uh, or, or me, of the Nicaraguan government being involved with narco traffic. Now, in early 1985, I was called by a police officer from Miami who was representing a guy who was the, the, the Medellin cartel accountant. And the guy told him that he could compromise the Nicaraguan uh, government in narco traffic. Ortega was the president then. But he will not deal with the FBI, he will not deal with the DEA because they were penetrated. He wanted to talk to somebody from the CIA or close to the vice president office who was the, the drug czar at the time. So he was a friend of mine, said, look, you are CIA, you know Don Greg from the vice president office, I'll let you to meet with him. I'll bring him to your home. I said, no, 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 you don't bring that SOB to my home. I go to your office. So I met this guy, Ramon Milian Rodriguez, and he told me that he got a tape that he recorded from an assistant of Daniel Ortega who went to Guatemala to call him. And they asked him to jump bail to set up a, 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 a drug operation, laundering operation for the Nicaraguan government in, pa in Panama. Uh, he would not deal with anybody but with me or, or the CIA. So I heard the information, I passed it on to the FBI, I passed it on to the CIA in Washington. I never heard of that again. Now, when I testified in Congress, one senator asked me during that time, on the, on the 28th of May, if I have any knowledge of the Sandinista involved in narco traffic, when he mentioned this specific case. Now, Kerry, who was not part of the Iran Contra Committee, but had his own committee there, sent his assistant, Jack Blum, to see where Ramon Millian was to talk to him. Now, they went to see Ramon Millian Rodriguez and they told him, look, it has to be true, but if you can compromise the vice president through Felix in this narco trafficking scene, we will lower your sentence. Now, it had to be true. You cannot lie to us. Of course, you take that to a crook. What did he do? He told him, oh, yeah, uh, we channeled $10 million from the Medellin cartel uh, to the Contra through Felix. He was a patron. He didn't touch a penny. But he saw his poor troops in the, in the field that didn't have any weapons. So they accepted from the Medellin cartel $10 million. Uh, I didn't touch a penny for himself, but he accepted $10 million. And in turn, uh, the vice president was going to be leaning with them, which is ridiculous. <clears throat> so I am flying in El Salvador, and my wife called me from Miami, and she was pretty upset because it was on the front page of the Miami Herald. My picture was when I was a second lieutenant in the army. On a big time, the battle said that I received $10 million from the Medellin cartel.
So she asked me, where is the money? No, I was just kidding. You know, I, I always say that. that she never, never say that. She said, look, I said, Rosa, you know, it's not true. He said, I know that. But here is the front page of the Miami Herald. And I work at Barry University and people are looking at me sideways. You know, your husband is involved in this. And um, besides, you have a subpoena right here from Senator Kerry's committee. So I asked her to send me, the, give me the phone number. So I called the, his, his number in, in, uh, in Washington. And I spoke to his office in there and said, look, you don't need a subpoena with me, but send the ticket in Easter because I'm doing mileage. So I sent the ticket in Easter. I flew to Washington. <clears throat> I went to the senator office in, 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 this, in the Senate office building. And there was this guy, Jack Blum, who represented Kerry, who was his assistant. Kerry wasn't there. And there was this, this lady, Robinette, who represented Mitch McConnell, who was the minority in the committee. For four, five hours, they deposed me. After five hours, both Mitch McConnell office and myself, we wanted an open hearing. But Senator Kerry's office insisted on a closed hearing. I told them there is no reason to have a closed hearing. I, the, I actually um, <clears throat> gang up, went out of the agency. I retired from the agency back in 1976. And this happened in 1985. There's nothing classified about this here. But they insisted it had to be a closed hearing. Because, of course, they didn't want the truth to come out. That what they were programming, saying around the bush had to do with, with the contract operation, all of that, was going to come down the drain. So they didn't want that to happen. So it had to be a close hearing. So we had no choice but to take the close hearing. I recall when I went to testimony and during the close hearing, uh, they asked me if I, wanted, if I wanted to say something. There was Senator Kerry was presiding and all these other senators, including Mitch McConnell. So I look at him and say, Senator, this will be the hardest testimony of my life. He said, why do you say that, Mr. Rodriguez? I said, Senator, it's very difficult to have to answer a question for somebody that you do not respect. And he don't respect you and you are doing here. Oh, blue, he blew his top. Mr. Rodriguez, because we disagree with you, we are not less patriotic than you are. I said, Senator, you didn't have the gut to throw your own medals when you were protesting the Vietnam War. He said, Mr. Rodriguez, don't believe everything you see in the press. The senator, I know that a hell of a lot better than you do. And then he told me, that was a veteran who asked me to throw his own mail. I said, yes, everybody thought it was your mail was throwing over the White House thing. And when that, that finish didn't finish in very good terms, actually. And for 10 months, for 10 months, uh, we wrote him letter asking for an open hearing. He never agreed to that. Until finally, about 10 months later, I got a call from Robin Neff from, from Senator Mitch McConnell's office and told me, if I was willing to go to Washington, I had a press conference with Senator Mitch McConnell and request from Senator Kerry an open hearing about this case. So I said yes. So I prepared a letter about three pages, which I explained how I met Ramon Millian Rodriguez, all the details on that, to the details, every single my participation on how I met this guy. So I went to Washington. We, we had the press conference. Senator Kerry then gave us an open hearing on the following month. Now, from Monday to Thursday, they have cameras in the room. For whatever reason, on Friday is the only day of the week they do not have any camera, even though they have press, but they don't have any camera co covering the, the hearing. He, they got me on a Friday. There was no cameras in the room. And I was the last witness by 7 o'clock at night, which means that most of the press were tired. They were there since 7 o'clock in the morning. By the time I testified, there were very few press present. And during that time, actually, he apologized to me. He said that he believed me. And I recall that he actually asked me if I would put the lie detector test. I said, oh, yeah. I am willing to take a lie detector test, but I'd like you to take a lie detector test, too, because you are doing this politically. I said, well, I will not take a lie detector test. He said, well, if you don't take one, I won't take one either. So on those terms, there was no lie detector test. So then what he did was he got, which he was fortunate, he got the best light detector or polygraph operator in the country, Dr. Raskin from the University of Utah. And he brought Dr. Raskin and, and got to Washington to give Ramon Mariano Rodriguez a light detector test. First question, did Mr. Rodriguez solicited from you $10 million from the Medellin cartel for the contract? Yes, deceptive, he was lying. Second question, did Mr. Rodriguez give you couriers in Central America to channelize those $10 million for, from the Medellin cartel to the contract? Yes, deceptive that he was lying. Third question, 
did Mr. Rodriguez in any way or form receive any money from the Medellin cartel? Ramon Millán Rodriguez refused to continue with the lie detector test. It was terminated at that point in time. Now, how does Senator Kerry report that on his, on his um, congressional record? First question, he had no choice. It was deceptive that Mr. Rodriguez has requested $10 million from the Medellin cartel. Second question, deceptive again, that Mr. Rodriguez gave carriers in Central America. It wasn't true either. On the third question, you know how Kerry wrote it? On the third question, whether Mr. Rodriguez received any Medellin money from the Medellin cartel, a, <clears throat> the, 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 the operator could not determine the veracity of the question. But he doesn't tell you that he could not determine the veracity of the question because Ramon Milian Rodriguez decided he was not going uh, to answer that, uh, that question. So if you are the one reading this testimony, you believe maybe something to it. The two questions, yeah, they were decided for the third one, whether he received some money from the Medellin cartel or no, it is uh, the guy would not determine the veracity of the question. But you were never told it was because the guy refused to continue with, with the lie detector test. That's why I despise the senator. I believe he's a liar. I don't trust him. Even when when the, when he ran for president, the, Viet, the uh, Vietnam veteran for the truth had a big rally against him on the west wing of the Capitol. Uh, what about a hundred thousand veterans against him and uh, i was one of the speakers against him kerry claims he had we have was wounded three times when he was in vietnam in the delta operating with the navy you know what he doesn't have a single bullet in his body the three so wounded that he requested the um the the, the purple heart the last one they want to give it to him he had to wait until the guy changed to be able to get it he probably caught himself and claimed that it was a a, a, a wound from a from a mortar a skid line, you know, from a piece of, of as a explosion from, from a mortar against them. Three times he, he requested the, 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 the medal of, of Purple Heart. You know why? Because there was an unwritten law during that time. If you are in a tour in Vietnam and you get wounded three times, you could request to be removed from the operational area on the same tour. And that's exactly what he did. Once he got his third medal that he caught himself and claimed that he was wounded, he then immediately requested to leave uh, Vietnam. And then along with Jane Fonda, he was the one who was critical, accusing of barbarity, uh, of that uh, the, the Vietnam troops uh, were assassinating people and all of that. And that's why it was very hard at that time when the United States military came back from there, they were seen by the American people with, as a disgrace. You know, they they were afraid to use the uniform when they came back. Sure. That's what I am so happy now when I see these people coming when they came from Afghanistan from a different world that they are, uh, with the respect that the American people respect them. Even on airplane, they will give their seat to them. They invite they, they invite them for uh, for the drink of of our food in the airplanes. It's completely different at the time that I was there. You didn't even dare to say you was in Vietnam because the American people hate you because of the propaganda by John Kerry and Jane Fonda. <clears throat> so that's basically the, the end of my presentation. Uh, if there is any question, I'd be more than glad to answer you. Yeah, we have a, a, quite a few uh, student questions that were sent our way. And first of all, thank you for your service and uh, you know, battling terrorists all over the world. And then it's unfortunate that you have to come home and battle politicians just looking for any reason um, to attack but it, you know, you came out on top. Um, so I have a question from Elias and Elias is in France and Elias, you should be able to unmute to ask your question. Yeah, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to hear your story and quite interesting. I mean, it's amazing. And as Ralph say, thanks for, um, being uh, against the terrorists and everything, you have to battle against that. So here's my question. Um, like for you, what's the most valuable lesson that you've learned during your career? The most, well, <clears throat> there were several of them. Uh, one that I learned was, especially not to trust everything that you read. Uh, because depending who write that, it, it cannot be true. I, I have seen histories about uh, myself 
dealing with shape uh, that is not true at all. In UK, if you get somebody from the Miami area, they will tell you that Shea cried, he, he pleaded for his life, which he did not. Or you still get people from the other side would say, well, on the contrary, uh, Shea was arrogant with him. He actually uh, spitted on him and he didn't talk to him. That wasn't true. We had mutual respect for each other and, uh, and, and that's the way we conducted our relationship when I met him in there. And it, it is important to, to keep that in mind. You have to be very careful who are you reading, what you are reading, the tendency of those people to be able to understand if they are telling you the truth or they have a political agenda behind them. That's extremely important for people who read the news in whatever situation there are. And, you know, and that's especially in this day and age with what, what we have is fake news and people pushing stuff out there on the internet. And, it, you know, he's completely right. Just always consider the source. Um, Gabriel is in Italy. Uh, Gabriel, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi. Do you think that war and discomforts like the one you passed one day will end and why? What was that again? So he, want, he wants to know, I'll, I'll help with this one. He wants to know if you think one day wars will end or do you think wars or conflict like this will always be around because of the differing cultures and societies we have? I don't think it will end, never end. Uh, it depends on the individual. For example, you got this guy like Putin. There's nothing that you can do about it. Uh, he had decided to invade uh, Ukraine, which is a terrible situation right now. And he really miscalculated the situation. He's in, he's in, he's in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bond right now what to do. He never expected that to happen. When there are people uh, who are head of a state, who have power and they have ambitions, uh, you cannot prevent them from doing what they do. So. Uh, people will provoke wars, unfortunately, and hopefully what we can counter that uh, effectively uh, on our side to come out of it. Um, we had a student from one, uh, a question from one of our students here in the States, and they wanted to know what advice would you give for anyone who's interested in pursuing a career like yours in military intelligence? Well, you have to decide for that. Well, first, now in my situation was different. Uh, because I didn't even know the CIA was the CIA when I joined the Bay of Pigs. Uh, I had no idea that it was uh, it was actually um, the CIA behind that. So I wasn't recruited for the CIA. It was an operation that I participated and then continued to work with them. And nowadays, first of all, they require a, a college degree, which I didn't require at my time. I, I didn't never had time to be able to go to college. I only went one time to a semester. And because of my work with the A's, I could not continue to pursue what I wanted to be, who was an engineer and architect. Uh, <clears throat> so you, first of all, you have to have a college degree. Uh, second, make sure that you, you have a clean record, that you have no drunk driving, uh, that you have a clean record, because they will go very thoroughly checking on that. And one of the people that will have more possibility of being picked up are those who have language capability. Especially nowadays, if you are able to speak uh, uh, Arabic, for example, it, it, they would be, be looking for people like you, okay, or Ukrainian at this point in time, because that's a necessity that they have. Uh, and then you have to apply, uh, get an exam from the from the uh, Office of Personal Management, and you know present uh, your request to the agency, and depending on your capability and their needs. Now, the agency have from different people. They have people um, are agents. Uh, operational agent like I did, they had intelligence officers that doesn't part participate in combat, but they are people who penetrate and trying to, to recruit people. You have medical personnel that work for the agency, there are doctors and uh, nurses that work for them, accountants that work for them because they have big accountants to run the agency operation at different levels. So they have all kinds of people and they have all kinds of opening. Uh, and depending on what you really like and what is available at that time, you have the chance to be able to uh, to get into the agency. But like I said, uh, having different language is a great uh, possibility that they will choose you because they are in need of people with different languages uh, in the agency. And, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that you guys can look for online, anyone who's interested in that. 
Um, we have a couple more student questions. This one's from Mev and she is in Italy and Mev, you should be able to unmute to ask your second question. Hello, hi, nice to meet you. I would like to know, um, sorry, hi, yeah, hi. <laughs> I would like to know um, the greatest sacrifice for American democracy and liberty you have faced in life. What was that again? She wanted, our, uh, Mev, uh, she wanted to know what is the, what we, in, your, in your opinion is the greatest sacrifice that you ever witnessed uh, for American dem democracy in your career? Uh, well, in my case, you know, I had a lot of motivation because I, I lost my country to communism. And I know what socialism and what communism is. Uh, that's unfortunate to see people uh, today, for example, when they elected this socialist guy in Peru, they have no idea what socialism is. Uh, I remember when, when Mike Wallace did 60 minutes of my life, he asked me if I was a, a warmonger, if I was always in search of adventure. And my answer for him was, you and a lot of Americans have no idea what it is to lose your country to communists, to be taken away from your home, not to be able to return, all your property taken away from them. There's something you have to experience to realize what that is. That's what I so worry in this country today, that people know exactly what socialism is. I hear this word progressive, and it's the same thing like socialism. It doesn't work, okay? It's nice in paper to say everybody to be equal. Now, my opinion of equality is equality and opportunity of the people to go forward. That you should be able to go to a school, you should be able, all of them be able to, to study, and then it depends on you as an individual to be able to progress or not. I give an example of having two brothers, one that get up six o'clock in the morning, go to work every day and work his rear off the whole day. And the other one will stay at home, look on television, having a drink and doesn't do anything. At the end of the month, you cannot expect that both of them have the same thing. It's impossible, all right? Whoever works more is entitled to get more things than the other guy who doesn't do anything. So in my idea on this thing is to be able to have opportunities, but then it depends on the individual. Not everybody is, is equal, it's impossible, okay? And the system uh, cannot have everybody equal, it doesn't work that way. It's beautiful in paper, equality, everybody is saying, it doesn't work. You need some people to be an engineer, you need some people to clean the street. It's, it's the necessity of life, the reality of life. And it depends on you as an individual if you want to progress or not. But there's a lot of people that I respect a lot of that have dedicated their life. For example, the life in, in the CIA to most of the people uh, is a, is a personal rewarding thing, but you cannot request any reward from anybody. Most of our people that retire, they cannot even say that they work for the CIA, what they have done. They have to say that they retired from the State Department or retired from engineering company. There is no recognition in that. In my case, because of the Che Guevara operation, one of these, it became public and I retired openly. So I can say that if I work for the CIA. But most of the other cases, people cannot. And you know, But you have the personal satisfaction to know that you have done what you have done and how you have contributed to the safety of this country. That's absolutely phenomenal. And for you guys that don't know, um, Mr. Rodriguez, like he, you, you've won, you've been the recipient of the Florida Governor's Medal of Freedom that you just recently got from Governor DeSantis, the Intelligence Star, the Silver Star for Valor in com Combat. Uh, was it you received the Cross for Gallantry in South Vietnam nine times? Was, it, was that nine times? Yeah. Um, the Naval Medal of Honor, uh, you know, uh, it's just, you have lived so many lifetimes in the span of one lifetime, and it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I actually got a message here from one of the students, and they wanted to say uh, that they are of Cuban descent, and they are very thankful for your work, and they loved listening to you, and this was a very special moment for them. So um, we will go with, oh, did you have anything to add? Can I say one thing that I forgot to mention? Of course. <laughs> During my presentation. I am a strong believer in destiny. When it's going to happen to you, it will happen to you. I, I wanted to give you an example that I forgot to mention to you while I was in Vietnam. During and my time in Vietnam, I was shot down five times helicopter. My helicopter was hit 25, 30 times. I don't know, during those two, two and a half years that I was in Vietnam. Now, there's one time uh, that it was no combat, was supposed to be no danger, and let me explain you what happened. I was supposed to be picked up in Benoit on an army helicopter to fly me to NABE, the naval base, 
to be able to get some intelligence for an operation that I was planning. Okay. So it was supposed to be, let's say, tomorrow the helicopter was going to pick me up at nine o'clock in the morning in Echo Pad in Penguat to try to fly me there only to get intelligence and come back again. Nothing of combat. That evening, the day before, we received a message from our units in Tainin province. It was one of the biggest units that we had. That there was a combat between our unit and the Viet Cong, and we had 10 PRU that were killed. It's very unusual, but normally the other way around. But we had 10 PRU killed. So I got a call from my boss, from Don Greg, and said, look, forget about going to Benhua, <clears throat> go to finance, and pick up the cash, because we pay them in cash. Now, the, at that time, the, the piastre was 117 piastre for $1. <clears throat> I had to pay 10 guidos, okay, for a whole year, you know, all of them. It's a lot of cash in a briefcase to bring it there to pay the widows in there. So I didn't even call the helicopter up. Uh, I, at 7 o'clock in the morning, they provided me with an Air America, a small craft, one engine aircraft. I got my briefcase full of money, and I flew to bank, uh, <clears throat> to take in. And I landed, my interpreter being, it was a Chinese, uh, Vietnamese interpreter was waiting for me. The, the plane left. And uh, when I got into his car, I said, what are you doing here? I said, I came here to pay for the 10 widows. He said, what widows? He said, you sent a message to our headquarters in Benoit saying that there were 10 PRU killed in this operation. The guy said, no, no, no. There were 10 Viet Cong killed. We had three people wounded. For the first time and the only time, the whole time that I was there, they mistake the guy who did the ciphering of the message, mistake the friendly for the unfriendly. The code that was supposed to go for the friendlies went the unfriendly. So we got the wrong information. I didn't have to go. So I had lunch with him. I, I waited for my plane. I flew back to Benoit. <clears throat> when I landed in Benoit, I went to see Don Greg. He looked at me and said, Felix, you are the luckiest man in the world. You must have a rabbit feet up into you know where. He said, what happened? He said, look, the helicopter came to pick you up, 9 o'clock in the morning. You wasn't here, it took off. It landed in Saigon to drop a couple of Americans who was going out on vacation to the United States. When the plane took off with another guy who was going to Ben to Ben uh, to, to Nabe the Naval Base, he had an engine failure, it crashed, exploded, it burned, and everybody inside the aircraft were burned alive. And I didn't, I was in that aircraft because of a mistake that never happened before and never happened after. So I really believe in destiny. When it is for you, you're going to get it. When it is not for you, you are not, you're, you're safe. So I really believe in destiny because especially of this experience and all that I had. That is, yeah, I, again, I can't wait for them to actually, to make a movie about your life. Um, I think they should. Uh, he, he has his, your memoir is uh, Shadow Warrior. Uh, that it, that's out on Amazon, and um, we will go with one more student question, then we'll let you go because uh, we know it's getting kind of late for those, especially the students in Eastern Europe right now. Uh, this is coming from Vittoria, and she is in Italy. Vittoria, you should be able to unmute to ask uh, the final question. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Felix, and thank you for your time and for your speech. I would like to ask you why did you choose this path, uh, this career? Um, like, is there is is there any specific reason, or were you just curious about this? Can you say that? Can you explain to them again? So why you chose chose this career path? You you were around seventeen when you when you uh, joined your military service. Was it a, was it um, because of your patriotism for your country, or was there some other reason? <clears throat> First of all, to be honest with you, I really didn't choose what I did. Like I said, when I came to Miami uh, after graduating for, for Tioman in 1960, I was going to go. But what I wanted to do was an engineering architect. Two of my uncles are engineer and architect. But then one thing that motivated me the most was seeing the firing squad taking place in Cuba. Cuba didn't have the death penalty before. But the firing squad that Fidel implemented from the very beginning was a complete disaster. I mean, the people who were the, the judges for that they didn't even know how to read or write. I saw one specific case of a Cuban mayor called Sosa Blanco, who was being in television. Here comes a farmer to tell Sosa Blanco that he killed his brother, okay, in front of everybody in television. So here comes the guy say, you killed my brother, and he's pointing at the prosecutor. 
The prosecutor had to say, no, no, it's not me. It's this guy next to me. So, if, oh, yes, you killed my brother. And guess what? His brother was not even killed. His brother has left Cuba. He was in Miami in exile, never told his family, and then came back and he was alive. And they executed this guy. So it got to a point that if you were a, a rebel soldier in Castro's army and you had a personal problem with a friend of yours because he took out your girlfriend or whatever, you accused him of being a Batista uh, sympathizer and officer, and they executed you. So there were hundreds firing a squad that were totally uh, wrong. That's what one of the things that motivated me to join what later became the, the Bay of Peak invasion uh, during the Bay of Peak. And then one thing led to the other. You know, I lost people during the Bay of Peak, very close friend of mine, uh, that we trained together and then they were killing the operation. And I felt a necessity that I should continue this fight until Q is free. And we tried through all of this year. I was involved in many, many operations that I cannot talk about it because they were personally done, maybe some sometimes maybe, maybe illegal, uh, to try to overthrow the government of Cuba. Uh, it, it created a, a desire that, that I should continue until Cuba is free, especially uh, remembering all of those friends of mine who died uh, trying to regain the freedom of my country. And that's what I did through all of these years. And even today, today, if I, now I, it's very difficult for me. I am going to be 81 years old uh, in, in two months, in May, May 31st. And of course, I cannot do the thing that I could do before. But if anything, I can I can do it to try to liberate my country. I will try to do so. Like I said, you know, you don't know what it is to lose your country to socialism or communism. I do because I lost mine. We thank you for sharing your story with us. And uh, if anyone's interested in. Um, learning more, uh, there's resources online uh, for the Hylia Gardens Museum honoring Assault Brigade 2506. Uh, we will have uh, links to that once this footage processes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to end the meeting. But before we do, Felix, we kind of had this tradition where we allow the kids to say thank you all at once to our special guests. Uh, Ralph, if there is somebody really that you think uh, is important, you want to talk to me, I'm giving my email. I'm glad to talk to them, whatever. They, and you they guys can you guys can send those requests to me. You guys all have my emails. And uh, before we go, can we all say thank you to Felix for sharing his incredible story with you guys tonight? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.